Welcome, everybody, to the Schmodown Twitch channel. I am Brad Gilmore. I'm joined by the incredible, the incomparable, the legend, Miss Jen Sturger. Jen, how are you? Legend. I don't know if I've earned that status yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Oh, I'm so excited to get to actually work with you, Brad. We always end up working opposite events from each other, so it's really cool that we get this opportunity to break yeah. down the Star Wars tournament together. No, I'm excited because last time you know I had to tag in for you in Atlanta, Georgia, when we had the Schmodown Live event, and now we're here doing this together. And I and I felt like this, Jen. If we're gonna break down the Star Wars tournament, we're gonna talk Schmodown. We're gonna do all that. Why not bring on somebody who is who is a legend in his own right and is a Star Wars super fan? And he's got kind of a busy weekend coming up. Very uh, let's bring busy him weekend. On. I'm shocked we could actually get him. <laughs> I am too. So let's let's not waste any time. Let's bring the man on himself. He is the American Nightmare. Cody, Cody, welcome to the show. Cody, welcome to the show. Hello. Can you guys hear and see me? Absolutely. I love Jedi. Can anyone Cody. hear me? All right, perfect. <laughs> yeah, that oh. was my display name. Oh, Cody, thank you so much for joining us. I know you have a super busy weekend with your match coming up against Lance Archer. How are you feeling going into this weekend? I feel uh, probably the best I've ever felt. Uh, as far as wrestling goes, my lungs, I, th I feel I have a, a legitimate third lung at this <laughs> point. Uh, and that's what it's going to take. He's a big, he's a bigger guy. So the longer the match goes, the more it's in my favor. And I don't sweat uh, Lance Archer and the murder hawk concept. And I, I get he had this great match with Will Ospreay and everyone, you know, got an erection over it. I'm not that into it. So uh, I, I think uh, I don't think it's not I think it's a, a, a challenge for sure. But uh, it's a challenge. I'm glad to accept and I was honored to be in the tournament honored to be part of it. And I, I'm looking forward to it. You mentioned that he's bigger than you though. You didn't take any of this quarantine time that you had to like bulk up a little bit. I'm just saying. I, I only saw you'd make this motion like this Jen and I have no clue what you asked me. I saw this. Oh. Well, maybe let me try. Can I take these off? Is it my headphones or is it my connection? It might be your connection. I just asked. Uh, you didn't take you didn't take his size into consideration at all, and maybe consider bulking up a little bit. I think that he's trying. Is he messing with me right now? Jen, can you hear me? I can hear you, sir. <laughs> can anyone? Hear me? We can hear you, Cody. Can you hear us? Why can I not hear you guys? Not sure, um, Ben. I don't, but you I don't, can hear me. We can hear you. Oh wow, that's 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 amazing. That's and I don't know what what do we do about this. You want me to call back in? Put the headphone. Yeah, get out and come back headphones. in. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna try to get Cody back here in a second. I was like, did I say something already to get myself in trouble? I thought you pissed him off. He seemed a little hot at it, but I didn't know. I, I didn't know if he was ribbing you or not. Ben Goddard's going to help us, our, our producer extraordinaire, Ben Goddard, get Cody back on because uh, I'm excited to talk to you about this TNT Championship that I know has been going on. The tournament's been going on the last several weeks on AEW Dynamite, and we got to talk about Star Wars because that's why we're here today. We're here to break down the Star Wars tournament. It's going to be huge. This is this is a massive opportunity, Jen, for not only people to display their knowledge in Star Wars, but to get critical critical points for their faction now getting back into regular play. Absolutely. Oh, hopefully we've got him back. Did we have you back? Am I back? Yes. No, I was just asking Cody. I was like, oh man, did I oh, get man. myself in trouble you guys already? Love this. <laughs> I just see Jen doing this again and I don't have a clue. I can't hear anything. Oh, it's gotta no. be, it's gotta be a uh, Cody, check Wait your headphones, somebody, make sure they're connected. Yeah, they're connected, yeah, they're connected bro. They're connected? Okay. You can hear me, but not Jen, not these two. I, I, Brad, just a very handsome face, just there, and I don't, I don't. You can hear me, Brad, Cody. Say something. But yeah, Cody, you can hear out. me. You can. Okay, I think we, I think we're good. Yeah, dude. Wow. Okay. All right, All right. I'll get out. All right. Well, Cody, we're, it's good to have you back here. Um, we're excited to talk to you. Excited to have you on, Jen. I know that you were asking him why didn't he take this opportunity to bulk up against Lance Archer. But I, I, have to ask I, I honestly was just wondering if that would be something that he considered going into this match. Brad, tell me what you said. Cause again, <laughs> okay. I, think I can just hear you. She's asking, she's asking, why didn't you take the opportunity to bulk up prior to your match with Lance Archer? Because he is such a bigger guy. 
Uh, I did, you know, my, my best to, to bulk up. I have a great trainer and a uh, little thunder, Carolyn. I think Jen's met Carolyn before. She's a, she's backstage at all the AW shows. I mean, bulking up, though, for wrestling is a, is a tricky road to go down. Guys take advantage of it. It becomes about pizza and eating everything in sight. And it's not like a – that doesn't look good on TV. Plus – as a wrestler, if you've ever had abs, if you don't have them, or if you don't have them again, like if you sh- you're fat all of a sudden, even if you're not fat, if right. there's, if you had abs and then you don't have abs, you're fat by the fans, you know, kind of perception. So I don't ever want to be fat. Plus, I don't I don't need to bulk up because here's the issue: he's seven feet tall. It's not a matter of like the width. This the the murder hawk is legitimately a very very tall. Uh, super heavyweight type, but not the first guy uh, of that size who I've been in the ring with. It's so yeah. cool. Every chance I, I talk to people, Cody, they all keep asking me if I've seen the TNT championship title and what it looks like. And I can't, I can't say I've seen it. When are we going to get a glimpse of this? Is it going to be at double or nothing? That's the first shot. Brad, what'd she say, man? Oh no. <laughs> I don't know what's going on, but she's trying to say. Um, I feel like it, he's punking me right now. I swear. Going to be revealed at uh, at AWW or nothing. The TNT Championship is that going to be the first time we see it, or are we going to get a glimpse this Wednesday, perhaps? I don't think we'll get a glimpse this Wednesday. You you never know. I know there's kind of a two trains of thought. Some people would really like to see this thing and get it out there. Uh, no one has seen it other than Tony Khan. Uh, I've been told it's just incredible and and it's his his vision and it's exactly been executed as such. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised there. You, just like with our generation, we like to press send on pretty much everything. We don't think anymore. We just press send and press send. I could see us hot shotting it and perhaps it being Wednesday on Dynamite. Uh, but if not, the first time you see it will be when Iron Mike Tyson presents it at the pay-per-view. I mean, that's incredible that you got Iron Mike out there to, to present the TNT Championship. And, you know, Cody, when I talk on my show, the Hall of Fame with Booker T and I, we talk about uh, all kinds of great stuff. And one of the things that he always brings up about his career is when he was in WCW and he beat Rick Martel for the television championship back then. And it really was the launching pad for his career in singles. It's when people started to recognize Booker as a main event caliber guy. Talk to me about the importance of the TNT Championship and why it was decided to be created. Well, I think the really unique situation is a lot of people had pined for perhaps a television title um, and something like that. And this is, I cannot think of another time this has happened in wrestling where the presenting network is the one that said, uh, we would like this to represent us. We would, we would like, you know, to commit. Jim Ross is really someone who's seen it all, done it all, has a great perspective on the fact that them, TNT, christening this title after them shows their commitment to us it shows our commitment to them so the fact that they wanted it uh is is what makes it uh so unique and it really sets it apart perhaps from i mean anytime you have a world championship a title that's presented after some might fall they might feel falls in that middle of the pack at its mid card uh belt a lot of people know i don't believe in that terminology and i think what you'll see uh, and what you've already seen with the body of work in the tournament and now uh this is a very unique title that hopefully hopefully could main event uh, a, a good many shows uh moving forward and hopefully starts uh with a strong legacy you've had a really crazy journey to get here though obviously you didn't have the best match obviously against mjf and now you've had probably one of the hardest roads to get to the tnt championship tournament what would holding this title mean to you well, A, I can hear you now, and <laughs> B, did you, did you not like my match with MJF? I lost, but did you not like it? No, I loved the match with MJF, Cody. I just think we all would have preferred a different outcome. I feel like you didn't like it, and I just kind of... Cody! The fact that Cody, I got the vibe too. start with me. Vibe too. It was you're weird. Such a, you're such a stirrer. You're just stirring like, the pot. I, uh, yeah... It, there's essentially one of the motivating factors going to this pay-per-view is not only the MJF match, but the Chris Jericho match. I, there's the same picture of me. You could have, you, you can't pick which is from which if you, 
take a look at these photos. It's me sitting on my ass in the ring, completely dejected uh, and disappointed because you don't want to make excuses in, in this world because that's all they come across as excuses. But one is a, you know, towel thrown in and the other is a very sharp and diamond studded ring to the side of the head. I mean, he pinned me in the center of the ring. So I, I give up my right to really talk, you know, considerable shit about Max, uh, at this point. Uh, but yeah, I don't want that image again. You want to, yeah. you want to, you want something new. Otherwise, it's really difficult for fans to to follow a story that's just heartbreak. And we put it out there it, it, in the parking lot at Daly's place in the very first AEW press conference. We talked about wins and losses matter, an area where not only do wins and losses matter, but winning at the big ones. You have to win at the big one. Otherwise, you're not a big one. So no pressure, but that's, that's the reality. <laughs> And that's all coming up this Saturday, AEW Double or Nothing. Um, it's going to be a, a, a really interesting thing to watch. You have that ladder match. You have Chris Jericho is going to be in there. And speaking of Chris Jericho, Chris Jericho just added himself, or he was signed in free agency to the movie trivia Schmodown. I think that's pretty big news. What's your reaction to that, Cody, now that Jericho is here in the Schmodown? Well, Chris Jericho has a, a good agent in Barry Bloom. He's really into Chris, like really, really into Chris. So I'm glad he's... <laughs> I'm glad he's doing it, uh, and I know that his fandom, you know, Star Wars fandom is, is, is so unique, but I know Chris's fandom is genuine, as he has a whole room upstairs, uh, uh, like, screening yes. room. Yeah, that is uh, done in the likeness of the Millennium Falcon, and, and kind of in its own way. Mm -hmm. it, it's the trim on the side of the wall. It's, it, it was a really cool kind of, like, artist choice. It's very A New Hope looking screen room that he has. And I think him and his wife and their whole family is really into Star Wars. Yeah, it was a really crazy signing. And I think it sit waves through our our movie trivia schmodown, obviously. Uh, but it got a lot of people talking, wondering if you would ever come and possibly compete, maybe in Inner Geekdom, which is kind of like our Harry Potter, our Lord of the Rings, our Star Wars, kind of all those those Inner Geekdom categories, or if you maybe would try your hat at Star Wars trivia. One thing that really concerns me <laughs> is, is I, uh, I am a deep, deep fan of these properties, and I would just hate it if I blew it. You know, that's the, the real... <laughs> That's the risk you take of going into any sorts of trivia. Like I just said all these nice things about Chris, but I can tell you like Chris doesn't, he's not even going to, this is a territory he's going to be really unfamiliar with. And I think he's just going to get squashed. This there's these, there's so many details that people hang on, especially in the fantasy genre. I would hate for people to think that, uh, you know, the classic fake nerd girl, you know, like that, you know, I, I don't know. Is that still an expression or is that not, is that a politically incorrect expression now? I, I mean, you know what I'm talking about? I, we know, we all know exactly what you're talking about. The well, girl that's like, like I love like, Star Wars, but yeah, you know, doesn't know anything yeah, about you, it. Yeah. You don't, you don't love it until you commit your time to it, until you watch every little bit of it, until you discuss it in a, in a polite discourse, not in some sort of like nothing it upsets me more than how our generation currently talks about Last Jedi. It is brutal. I would, it, it's the worst, all, most awful situation ever. If you want to turn heel in any form of entertainment, just say that you loved The Last Jedi like I did. Because <laughs> people get really upset. And I, yeah, I feel like we got to get better at how we discuss it. I don't want to blow it, but I'll say this. If I ever am needed for trivia, if y'all want me for trivia, I'll trivia all day long. I'd be all about it. Awesome. That's amazing. Where did your love for Star Wars come about? Because I know you and Brandy are huge fans. You did the whole Road 2, even that was kind of Star Wars themed on May the 4th. Where did that fandom come from? So uh, I think the Kenner line, the Shadows of the Empire line of toys they had out. Uh, I got all those toys, but I had never seen at that point in my life the original trilogy. But I bought all these toys and I so I had Luke and he's in like his Imperial Guard get up and I had uh, Chewie and, and all, all these characters from Shadows of the Empire. But I created my own canon because I hadn't really ever seen 
the original trilogy. I knew enough that like Luke is your protagonist, but I had my whole little canon set up and it was ridiculous because <laughs> then, then the special editions hit the theaters and my mom was a kind of unconventional mother, really great mom, but unconventional in the sense that I say, hey, I want to go see these movies. Cool, she would just drop me off. So I, she dropped me off and I went and I watched A New Hope, the special edition. And even at that point in technology with THX sound, it was louder than any other movie in the theater. You could hear it next door, like you could hear it rumbling. And after I watched A New Hope, I was just hooked, like hook, line, sinker. I needed to know everything that was different from the original trilogy. I needed to go rent the original trilogy. Uh, and then I kind of connected with it on a really personal level because it's, to me, at its core, almost all the movies, particularly the Skywalker saga, is about the parents and their kids. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in the original, it's, you know, about a dad and his son. And I had, a, uh, you know, those big, st you know, shadow with Dusty and things of that nature. So I identified in a weird way uh, to it. And to this day, that's probably the thing that I emotionally connect to the most with all the Star Wars movies. That's my favorite scene is Return of the Jedi, uh, right when they capture him and they're walking across that, uh, walking across that bridge on Endor. And he's, he's this close to, you know, turning back and, and, you know, going back to being Anakin Skywalker, but he doesn't. And then they have this light to green, but he doesn't do anything with it. It's just a really masterfully shot scene. Uh, but yeah, that that's, I could go on forever. So I don't so know. So wait, so wait, Luke. if you had your own canon, how are you booking Luke Skywalker? <laughs> so in, when, it, when it came to Shadows of the Empire, this is before I read any of the, you know, the Zahn novels or anything like that. So I had him, I thought, this doesn't sound so stupid. I thought Chewbacca was like his guy. Like I thought Chewbacca was like Luke's uh main you know hang along sidekick and i thought han was was a middle middle of the role like road player like i thought he was both empire and i thought he was both you know republic or the you know the rebel alliance what have you so yeah it was it was bad and this was back when you're a kid and you're as i was getting i was an older kid at this point so the playtime is more elaborate you've got a full setup uh you've got floss hanging from the door so that you can do a zip line but where they really excelled, even though my canon was wrong, where they really excelled were in all my Battle Royals wrestling. I brought the Star Wars people in all my Battle War, uh, Royals wrestling. They did really well. They did well. Oh, so Cody, we got some questions for you from our audience and from Streamlabs. Yeah. Do you mind if we share them with you? If there's anything you don't want to answer, yeah. totally understand. But let's uh, we're gonna have our producer Ben jump on and help us with these. And what we got? Uh, from Dagan. Hey Cody, big fan awesome. of you and AEW. I live in Vermont, only a two-hour drive to Boston, so was bummed to see the AEW show postponed. Here's a question for you: If you had to pick one, Star Trek II: The Wrath of Khan or The Empire Strikes Back? What's the Star Trek? Which Star Trek? Uh, the Wrath of Khan, the second one. Oh, I mean, that Empire Strikes Back is the greatest movie ever. <laughs> the greatest movie ever made. And like Wrath of Khan is Wrath of Khan is the best Star Trek movie, but if like to me if I'm talking to you and Empire is not in your top 3 or honestly if I'm talking to you and Empire is not your number 1, I feel like you're not educated. Like <laughs> I feel like you're not right. <laughs> yeah, like, That's such a nice on, I don't know, especially today when people like, so Empire for sure, loved Wrath of Khan, and it's kind of placed in the Star Trek film world. It's the best Star Trek movie to some, although Shakespearean Klingons a few years later, it's really special too. But yeah, no, Empire for sure. And I got one more for you, Cody, uh, from Michael Nip. Uh, so today it got announced that Timothy Oliphant from Justified and Deadwood is cast in Mandalorian season two. And does Cody think Timothy Oliphant might be Cad Bane on the Mandalorian? Oh, oh, Ooh. <laughs> talk about such a good, that's a life. Like what a character if it's Cad Bane. And I don't know. I mean, the more, Baloney, 
is involved in anything, the better. Filoni's outlook on Star Wars and being kind of the protege to George and whatever have you, like, Filoni, if you put all of Star Wars in his hands, it's going to be, it's going to be wonderful. I know that's not what's happening and it's open to so many interpretations, but man, Cad Bane, I mean, you've already got Ahsoka going to be live action, uh, yeah. Boba, the potential for, potential for Rex, uh, Rex more than Boba matters to me. And I don't know if other people feel that way, but Cad Bane with the hat, Cad Bane with the hat and how important that hat is to him. Wow. I would, I, I mean, I would, I would lose it. I would lose it with fandom if we, I didn't even consider we were getting a Cad Bane. That I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> You're Giddy beside yourself it. now. I yeah. got we know you've done some acting. Obviously, you had your run on Arrow. It's like, would you? What would you do to be able to be a part of Star Wars canon and be potentially on Mandalorian or something yeah. similar? That's a great question because you know Sasha Banks, Gina Carano, their MMA wrestling going to be in Mandalorian. I feel like you're just such a perfect fit for something like that. I, I, I honestly, I mean, there are very few things that I would like walk. No, I'm not gonna say I was. Wrestling is my baby. It's my number one thing in the world. <laughs> you almost said it. <laughs> You're like, so wait, I get to be in there, Star Wars? <laughs> I mean, I I think what I would like the most is just if I was in any Star Wars presentation uh, uniform. You know, like if you look at the uniforms they're wearing on Hoth or you look at the uniforms – uh, they were wearing throughout the original trilogy. Even now, like I, I'd want to be in one of those roles to where I got a uniform. It just and they have the best. Have you ever seen some of the stuff they're wearing? Offset, like the Empire <gasps> stuff, the, uh, the the parkas. Cody yeah, will work for, for gear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I would love. I just want a uniform. They could give me the most low bit part ever, and I, I would, I would give it my all. I'd be really into it. I mean, but a physical physical actors who do a lot of stunts, like uh, I'd be capable to do. I mean, really great things happen with Ray Park. I mean, his not his role, and then he made it his role. He created a character that's like such a crazy parallel to wrestling because 1999 or whatever with Phantom Menace, he's just doing high spots. High spot, high spot, high spot. There's no story to it, but people loved him and it's this crazy parallel to wrestling because we're going that way too where wrestling is getting a little less about the story and a little bit more about what they do in the ring so it's just this weird parallel but yeah man i don't even know how to answer it i would i just want to <laughs> i think we got one more stream lab for cody before we let you go cody we really appreciate the time ben jump back in yeah. here with that stream lab. uh this is from jj winward hey cody who's your favorite star wars minor character and why is it watto <laughs> <laughs> ben. ben he was asking you here ben where Star ben? Wars minor character and why is oh, it why okay. and it's got to be my connection it's the worst one more time who is your favorite star wars minor character and why is it wada i mean He's a Troidarian. Mind tricks don't work work on him. You know what I'm saying? Like, also, I think Watto in that classic uh, pod race game for 64. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I haven't played it in a minute, but don't you have to like go into Watto's shop for all the upgrades as you play through the campaign? I could be wrong, but Watto, mind tricks didn't work on him, even though he left it up to that chance cube. Watto's a huge part. I, I, he's not my favorite minor character, though. I don't know why I'm putting Watto. On a pestle here. Who is really my favorite minor character? I mean, is there such I can't a say, minor Star Wars? Well, I mean, he is a minor character, but time remembers him differently. But Akbar, I think Akbar. Time remembers him like he had freaking 50,000 lines. He barely says anything. He's like in two scenes in the so, whole saga. Yeah. <laughs> and he, you know, he went he went down in Last Jedi, and and uh, Vice Admiral Hodo had to step up. Yeah, I I'd say Akbar also because his story on Clone Wars as a uh, as a youngster when he when they're when they're having the uh, underwater you know, season four, 
they have that underwater series that's really good with him and the civil war that's going on his planet. Yeah, I'd say Akbar. I love it. I love it. Future TNT champion Cody Cody is going to compete in the movie trivia showdown Star Wars. That's what we're hearing. Uh, Jen, let's <laughs> find the uh, find the. Look paper. at you, Brad. Starting starting rumors and stuff. I well, Cody. The pot. <laughs> Cody, best of luck to you this Saturday, guys. If you want to check out Double or Nothing, it will be on this Saturday. You can see it on all major cable and satellite providers, as well as Bleacher Report Live and Fight TV for all of our international fans. Cody, what am I forgetting? Is there going to be the pre-show? That's going to be on YouTube? Buy-in? Uh, yes. The buy-in, yeah. buy but also the countdown. As an, exec as an executive in the company, I should know those answers. So I'm going to uh, guess on them. Uh, <laughs> yes, I am. I'm, so the... The buy-in, the buy-in is also uh, on your your you know pay-per-view provider, giving you the opportunity and the time to buy in the pay-per-view. I do believe it's also on YouTube, and then the countdown special is Friday night. Uh, awesome! And the countdown special, wait. more information about the countdown special on Dynamite this week. And I'm also super sorry. I know my connection was terrible, so I apologize for everyone for my terrible connection. Oh, no, man. You were great. We appreciate you coming on, talking a little Schmodown, talking a little Star right. Wars. We're going to have to have you back someday and talk about theme parks. That's my second love, too. <laughs> so we'll have to do it sometime. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Cody, thank you so much. We know you're a busy, busy what man. Best of luck. Favorite ride? I got to go. I got to go OG. I mean, it's Pirates. Pirates is always going to be my favorite. Rise ride. of the Resistance is a new LA ride. Pirate. LA Pirates, not, 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 so not Orlando. Yeah, L.A. Pirates is something. Um, this, I mean, that's a great choice. You can never go on. Rise of Resistance was really special. It's marketed incorrectly, though. It's a 30-minute experience. It's not. It's three different queues and then the ride. But I'm not getting into the marketing of it all. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, I got to – you know what? Has anyone tried the Minnie and Mickey thing before the parks closed? No, I didn't get to. Yeah, so that they're whatever replaced the great movie ride. That's legendary because that's Mickey's first real attraction. So we should all kind of pay homage to the mixer. We Gosh. Got we, got what, we got to. What don't you know about Cody? This is insane. <laughs> well, we'll have to have you back when you know you aren't fighting for the TNT championship, you know? Absolutely. I would love to be back. All right. Thank you so I much, Cody. It. That is the American Nightmare Cody. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. All right, Jen. I mean, how how do you how do you start it off any better than that? The American Nightmare himself, future TNT champion, uh, AEW executive vice president. I mean, the man has a laundry list of titles that go with his name, and I appreciate him giving us some time. Yeah, absolutely. And hopefully, he can add TNT championship to that list of titles as well this weekend. So it's a really cool name for a title. I know it's named after the network, but a TNT championship really sounds badass. If you want my personal opinion, I can't wait to see what the thing looks like. That's my oh. favorite thing as a wrestling fan the title reveals and mm -hmm. it's either the greatest thing that you've ever seen or it's not. I'm feeling like this one's going to be one of the greatest ones we've ever seen. I haven't been disappointed with any of the titles that AEW's put out because I am a sucker for bling. Okay. Yeah. Put bling on anything. I'm in. I'm it's all. I mean, I have rose gold headphones for, I mean, yeah. just, come just, on. Just, just don't give it to Chris Jericho at a steakhouse and you should be okay. <laughs> um, but we should so talk about cold. It. I know I had to, I had to, but um, mm. we should talk, we should talk about this thing that we're here to talk about. The star Wars absolutely tournament is going on. I mean, this is a, this is a stack tournament, eight person tournament. It's going to happen real quick. It's going to be only here on Twitch live. So make sure you check that out starting Wednesday. And here's the thing, Jim, this is more than just a tournament for tournament sake. This is more than just a tournament so that he, people can get uh, a shot at Alex Damon. This is a tournament for points for your faction. We, we are, Seriously here, we're in such a tight race. You have Din, you have Swag, you have Finstock Exchange there at the top. All of them competing toward the end of the season to see who's going to be the top faction. And this Star Wars match, check this out. Every match, except for the play-in match, is worth three points. An extra point if you knock them out. Almost a total of four. So the winner of this can get 12 points for their team. That is massive when it comes to changing the rankings here. Just talk to me about what you think um, the strategy is for a lot of these people going in, knowing all that is at stake points-wise. I mean, obviously certain factions have just a heavier burden on themselves at this point, but we also, I talked a little bit about this with Ben Bateman the other day. 
the scheduling at the beginning of the season was very much based on players' availability. So that's kind of put some factions at a disadvantage just because they couldn't get players in town and things just couldn't get lined up before the pandemic hit. So we are still looking at that. Uh, there's still plenty of season left, but the Star Wars and the Inner Geekdom tournaments are team's chance at getting some extra points on the board. And yeah. I think you're going to see people that we haven't seen in a while, and hopefully they've taken that time off to really sharpen their skills. Like, I feel like the person I'm the most excited to see right now is Molly Damon. The fact that she was a free agent until just a week ago is astounding to me. Like, I, I think it became something of a, of a thing where maybe she didn't want to compete at first because she didn't want to necessarily go up against Alex. But then I think something came over her where she's like, no, I want to differentiate myself. I want to be separate from um, I want to be separate from Alex. And now all bets are off because she could potentially it could potentially come down to her having to face Alex one day. And then they're not only fighting over a belt, they're fighting over who's sleeping on the couch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, who's going to have that last chair of the Millennium Falcon between the two of them? But here's the thing that you talk about Molly Damon. Let's talk about Alex first. Mm -hmm. Alex Damon has been the most dominant Star Wars player that we've ever seen. I mean, by far and above, he's got the highest accuracy rating of all time. He's got the most wins of all time. Most title defenses goes along with that. Out of 128 questions asked to this man, he has answered 117 correctly. That's a 91 and a half percent accuracy rating it's it's off the charts what he's able to do but even with that he went in the third round uh in the draft he still went in the third round and that tells you what a lot of players going into this or managers were thinking about star wars because traditionally we've only had one two maybe three or four matches at the most in star wars and this is this season is going to be the most star wars matches that we've ever had so right, now Raph is looking great with that pickup I'll one up your what what you were talking about third round. I look at it this way: a Star Wars player is a lot like an NFL kicker. You you don't seem to think that you're gonna need them, but then you realize when you don't have a good one, you're kind of screwed. And that's what I think is going to be. That's the best analogy I can give you when it comes to being a Star Wars player. You may laugh at someone that takes a kicker in the third round, but trust me, you're going to need that person that's going to be able to bring you home those points when it matters. Absolutely. I think that that's a phenomenal analogy because you don't, you don't think, like I said, going into this, a lot of people are thinking, okay, I got to get singles down. I got to get a good team. People are thinking about IG star Wars was coming last and they really are the NFL kicker. But then when you have somebody like Alex Damon, who is a champion, who's a belt holder, he is, he is holding a championship title. Currently he goes in the third round. It tells you kind of what they're thinking about with star Wars. And now to have this opportunity, you saw at this free agency deadline, people scrambling to make sure that they had Star Wars locked in. And you're right, Molly Damon was the name that was thrown around by everybody. Hey, you got to look at Molly Damon. You got to get Molly Damon. Molly Damon could be the person. I know a lot of managers pursued her, including Roxy Stryer herself. Roxy's like, if I could have both Damons on one team, it would be phenomenal. <laughs> um, but I, I, she, she ends up going to the usual suspects, which I think is such a great pickup for Sam Levine. Sam Levine completely changed the face of his team i think sam levine has honestly hands down won this free agency and this this second secondary draft essentially is what they had yeah. um i think sam came out on top of this and is going to really really make the usual suspects have a good run the second half of this season well but some people at first before the molly damon announcement remember he made the trade where he traded jada paramo and ken knapsack and a first rounder for Ethan Irwin. And so you knew he was going to be making moves in the Star Wars division than the minute he moved Napsack. You yeah, know what I mean? To me, to me, I was questioning it because because I didn't think that he had the in on Molly Damon for some reason. I thought that she was going to go rock stars. I thought she was going to go maybe somewhere else. And then when I see you trade away a guy like Ken Napsack, somebody who's a former champion in this league, he was Star Wars champion, had one of the greatest matches of all time, came down to the last second in that Iron Man match against Sam Witwer. I'm thinking, Sam, what are you doing here? This is Ken Napsack. This is the guy. And then he picked no, up. No, 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 no. You can't say that. He was the guy. And I feel mm -hmm. like Ken's time in Star Wars has very much dwindled because the game's changed. And if you don't adapt with the game and you don't make the changes in order to keep up with the young competition that's coming in, you're going to find yourself left out and just being talked about as, oh, Remember that time Ken had that run in Star Wars? That's where we're at right now, unless Ken can up his game. 
Yeah, no, no, I agree. And I want to talk more about Ken here in a second. But back, back to Molly Damon. Molly Damon, we only saw her the one time in Chicago. And, it, I mean, it wasn't the most phenomenal performance of all time. She was 78% on her accuracy rating, almost 79 which is great. Uh, but when you compare it to Alex Damon, Joseph Scrimshock, even Kim Knapsack, it left something to be desired. Why do you think Molly didn't maybe perform as well at that first Chicago Live event? Was it because this is the first time I'm here, the thousand people – Pressure's that was the biggest the crowd you could possibly play in front of Brad. That's what happened. Let's be real. <laughs> Let's put you in front of a room full of a thousand people and it's your first time like actually competing in something. We'll see how well you do. Yeah. I know I wouldn't want to be in her shoes. Like that is the most, I mean, it's bad enough when you bring rookies into the studio and you put them under the lights, you put them under our studio, like put them next to our studio audience. You put them around all these people that they've watched for years on the internet and you ask them to face them under live circumstances. Uh, it's like all that knowledge you had just, you know, but I do. I, I'm not saying people, people in the chat were saying that I was throwing Ken under the bus. I'm in no way throwing Ken under the bus. Ken was one of the best star Wars players we had. He is a big face of that division. That being said, things have changed. And I think we're all in denial if you don't want to think that. I think that you're right. And when you look at someone like a Ken Knapsack, I kind of compare a lot of things to, to the UFC. And Chuck Liddell was a phenomenal performer. When Chuck Liddell went out there, he was the man. He was the champion. He was the ice man. He was MMA. And then you saw what happened toward the tail end of his career. People came in who were more evolved fighters. People came in who have spent their entire careers training in all disciplines of MMA, and it wasn't like the old school, we're just going to go out there with what we know and try to duke it out with the Tito Ortiz's of the world. You had to be a skilled technician in all disciplines, and I think that that's the difference here with a Ken Knapsack versus an Alex Damon. Ken, this man, this man came in with what he knew. He doesn't strike me as the guy who's going to go out there and study. And then you have a machine, a super machine like Alex Damon, who... I can only imagine is helping train Molly for her first round matchup. That's what makes me think that Molly Damon is a threat in this but that's entire. Gotta, but that's gotta suck when like they sit there and he's preparing her for all these matches, and then it comes down to the day when they've got to face each other, and then it's like, baby, you on your own on this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Then that that's when like it gets a little it gets a little hasty in the Damon household. But I still think that with his expert tutelage. Molly Damon has to be the favorite in this round one match, even with a guy like Adam Witt. Here when, here's the thing. Adam Witt's hilarious. I love Adam Witt. He's funny. He's entertaining. And the man loves Star Wars. And as we're looking here at the at the bracket, you see Molly Damon and Adam Witt there in the first round. Um, he, he was very impressive in his match against Sean Sullivan, even going so far as hitting a five-pointer, which set the comments ablaze. The man knows his Star Wars, so it's by no means an easy matchup for Molly Damon at all. But I, I still think that Molly Damon has the goods to go out there and do it. Ben, you got something for it? Uh, just you real quick, guys, because we we just qualified to be an affiliate on Twitch. So now people can subscribe. Nice. Well, if you guys yeah, want I was to wondering. subscribe. Yeah, I feel so like I half, the the comments, half the comment yeah. section, Ben, thought they were having seizures. They're like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. They're like, and so, that was when the edibles kicked in. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> these, these, this, this brownie isn't doing anything. Whoa. Whoa. You take a well, second part and you're like, I wait, <laughs> I have made a grave mistake. <laughs> What's the difference, Ben, between following and subscribing? Explain. So following is like subscribing on YouTube. It's absolutely free, doesn't cost anything, and you get notified when someone goes live. Subscribing is how you support the channel, just like donations on YouTube. So now it's like you can either you get a free subscription. If you guys have Amazon Prime, link your Twitch and your Prime uh subs together, and you get a free Twitch Prime subscription for one nice. month and it doesn't auto renew so you won't get any secret charges but if you do want to subscribe and help uh, support the Schmodown channel it's five bucks a month and we appreciate everything it's never expected always very very thankful for it guys so thank you for helping us get there with the follows and the watch hours don't mean to Brad, interrupt guys I just had Brad, to I had to you knew it had it. to be when you and I were here right absolutely it just makes sense, just makes oh my sense. God, you're my dream boat for sure <laughs> right <laughs> The green boat is in the building. Um, oh, giving so you a awesome. soundboard was the worst idea of all time. It's terrible. Frank Janish hates it. Um, but yeah, no, congrats. Thank you for everybody who's already supported the Movie Trivia Schmodown Twitch channel. That's awesome. I'm glad that we were on the air as it happened, as Jen shows her beautiful mug there to everybody. And I'm talking about the cup, not 
her. Well, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> I couldn't help it. But anyway, let's 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 go back and talk about this first round match. So Adam Witt again had a great uh, showing against Sean Sullivan. So I think that it's not as easy as an out for um for some for Molly Damon as some people no, think. She's absolutely have not. To on you. Adam had a really great showing in that in that last match he had. But that said, um, it's still going to take more knowledge than what he showed in that round to beat someone like a Molly Damon. And trust me, I know how Sam and let's be honest, Rachel, because she's definitely, you know, back there pulling strings as well. I know how those two prepare for matches and they're not going to like let Molly just fly by the seat of her pants here. I guarantee they've got her on a strict, strict studying regimen, those two. But also if I'm Molly Damon, you know, I'm sure I'm feeling a little bit of the pressure. Not only was I a highly sought after free agent, um, you know, the partner to Alex Damon, who's the best Star Wars player ever. So there's gonna, I feel like there's gonna be a lot of pressure on her to perform. Do you think that's just because of that last name? Yeah, it's kind of like what Cody was talking about before he got, you know, before we, we had him on, where you have that last name Rhodes, you know what comes with it, and Rhodes, essentially the same happens with Damon in the Schmodown in the Star Wars division. Yeah, and so she has to live up to the name, and I just wonder if that's going to hurt or hinder her at all in her performance. Because here's the thing: some people pressure's on. They got no problem. We've been watching the last dance with Michael Jordan for the last you know five weeks every Sunday. When the pressure was on, MJ came to play. That's what he wanted. He thrived. And Dennis it. Rodman went and joined the NWO, but that's besides the point. That's true. <laughs> Rodzilla, baby. Rodzilla. Um, but I, I think my question about Molly is, is the pressure going to be too much for her or is she going to rise to the occasion? I think that's a really big question for her going into the first round because here's the thing. If Molly goes out there and loses – grand fashion in the first round i mean what does that say for her going forward in star wars would she be demotivated to play with the usual suspects no. want to keep her around will they drop she doesn't the strike me as the type that would take an l and not come back for more i feel like she's the type that taking a loss would just motivate her she's not gonna be you know when some people it's like i tell this to any rookie that comes into the league and then is given their first loss Specifically, I remember having this conversation with Smets one time when he lost. Uh, I forget who it was to. I'm assuming it was Kalinowski, maybe. Uh, but yeah. I remember having this conversation with him, and I said, please don't let this shake you or deter you because I can't tell you how many times I've seen players come back from a loss and then go on just a huge winning streak because that loss changes the way that they study. It changes the way that they prepare. And honestly, it changes their approach to the game. And they say, I'm not going to let that happen to me again. I'm going to go, I'm going to be different going forward. And so I always, whenever I see a rookie come in and struggle like that um, with, with how they accept a loss, it's not how you accept the loss. It's how you move forward from it. Oh, absolutely. And I think that, like I said, Molly Damon, I, I would imagine that she's the, the Vegas favorite here to to take it in the first round against Adam Witt. But, you know, we'll, we'll have to see because, again, Adam Witt has deep knowledge and I'd be he's not going to be an easy person to try to defeat no. in the very first round. I, I'll tell you that that much uh, is true. Um, let's look at the second match, though, here in round one. And then I want to take a look at where the teams stand. So, Ben, if you could uh, pull up the rankings of the teams by points for me, that'd be great. I think it's on the Schmodown Live. Um, but you have Joseph Scrimshaw and Andrew Dimolanta. Now, there's been a lot of talk about Andrew Dimolanta. Andrew Dimolanta has wanted um, all kinds of stuff. He, he, he's wanted Alex Damon. He wants to get a shot at Alex Damon. Um, let's talk about that in versus Joseph Scrimshaw. A guy, Joseph Scrimshaw, who is just as knowledgeable as Alex Damon. This mm -hmm. guy is incredible. I'm um, looking at his stats right now. Out of 80 questions asked to him, he's answered. 71 correct that's good for an 89 percent accuracy rating just two points behind alex damon um and then andrew Demolanta, he's over two he's yeah. over two but the guy is still as knowledgeable 89 percent accuracy rating this is a great first round matchup and here's the thing it's honestly i'm sad these two had to meet each other in the first round because it's going to be an absolute barn burner uh that said uh i hope that there's some kind of plan in place to help Demolon to get over those losses that he's had. And I also hope there's some kind of plan in place for Gucci to finally learn how to pronounce his name because that's an issue. Uh, but the exchange went after him for a reason. Yeah. And they, nope. they only go after winners. 
So no. they clearly saw something in him that was like, this is our guy. Well, the thing is, he's knowledgeable. The guy's got all the knowledge in the world. He just has to be able to implement it inside the confines of the game. Now, here's the other thing that we have to talk about. The Finstock exchange you bring up, they're sitting pretty in first place right now. This is what Bobby Gucci likes. This is what Ben Bateman likes. This is what Roca, Merle, Riley, they're all used to being in first place. I sense you getting a little heated right now, Brad. Well, I mean, ah, you know, a little bit. <laughs> Because they were complaining on backstage, and yes, they were complaining. And as we look here, leave that up for a second, Ben, because I want to break this down because this is very important when we're talking about this match. They were complaining that, oh, why? How does Andrew Demolata get Joseph Scrimshaw in the first round? This is crazy. You know, they they shouldn't get each other in the first round. That should be a semifinals or a finals. Well, here's the thing: Andrew Demolata's zero and two. It doesn't matter how knowledgeable. He yeah, is. let's not pretend that like. Scrimshaw winning would be a huge upset. The man knows how to play in live events, especially huge live events. He played in Chicago. Come on. Like, we can't pretend like this guy doesn't know how to operate under pressure. We just don't. No, absolutely. And, and but my thing about Andrew Demolanta is he's 0-2. He he he's a great player. He's a phenomenal player, but he hasn't won yet. So I don't know why he'd get a favorable seating if he hasn't even won yet. So that's my first thing. But the second thing about Andrew Demolanta. He holds the keys for the Finstock Exchange. He is the gatekeeper because if Andrew Demolanta doesn't go out there and win and win big in this tournament, the Finstock Exchange is going to get dropped out of first place because you have to think about it. Each match worth three points, maybe four if you can get that knockout. That is huge for any other team who's knocking on the door to the Finstock Exchange. So if he loses, if Andrew Demolanta loses in the first round, we're almost guaranteed to have a new front runner this season in the movie trivia Schmodown and the Finstock exchange is knocked off their pedestal. Talk about the pressure. Talk about the pressure for Andrew Demolanta. As, as you would love to say, this is heavy doc. <laughs> this is heavy. <laughs> heavy. Oh, but I, like I said, I, I see a lot of people chiming in in the chat and I just, I just think that we're all a little delusional if we are going to just write Scrimshaw off. Like, like every time he comes back, he comes back with more and more knowledge. He's not sitting around at home doing absolutely nothing. And believe me, he's had a ton of time in quarantine to get ready for this tournament. And I think you're going to see a hungry and dangerous Scrimshaw. You know, Personally speaking, I see Joseph Scrimshaw going very far in this tournament, if not all the way. I know Frank and I talked about it on the rundown this past week. It is his density <laughs> to go out there and do it. I appreciate you, Channel 19. Oh, for that. you guys get us. You get us so much. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that just the pressure for Andrew Dimolata, again, knowing that his team season, perhaps their season is on the line. I mean, it's very possible that a loss here – and big pickups by the Den or Swag or anybody who's in that top three, top four in the in the rankings right now, they can go out there and capture this and run away with it, especially if whatever team that is goes far in IG, you have a, a brand new front runner. So Andrew Demolanta, even though he's lost, even though he's lost twice, he is a he is a strong competitor. We know his knowledge is there. But I'm just worried that again, like I talked about Molly Damon, the pressure could get to him. And then there goes the Finstock Exchange. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it doesn't sound like you'd be too disappointed about it. <laughs> well, you know, here's the thing. Hey, don't don't you love don't you love Roca Carter? came after you pretty hard. I you know, Roca Roca is you know, he's old. He's an old man. And that's what old men do. They yell and they scream and they complain and this, that, and the other. I'm not worried about John Roca. He's the last person that the boat is worried about right now. But we want to thank everybody for all the subs that y'all have gifted here on the Twitch channel so far. We're, we're not even halfway through this because we still have to get to the other side of the bracket. But again, if we see Molly Damon going forward in this, is that your prediction? Molly Damon moving to the next round, Jen? I really do. I really feel great about Molly Damon coming to this. I, I know Adam's had a really good showing thus far. And I know he's going to be upping his protein and he's going to be working really hard to get through this first round of the tournament. But I just feel like this is Molly's destiny to be in this league. I think so too. I think that Molly, I don't think it's going to be, a, she's not going to run away with it. I think it's going to be a hard fight with Adam Witt. Absolutely. But I think she's going to end up getting out of, of the first round, moving on. And I think, man, and it's not just because I want to see it. Trust me. It's not because I just want to see it. But I think Andrew Dimolanta <laughs> as a, as a, <laughs> As uh, Winston did to Roxy the other night, uh, the other week on the Schmodown, 
He's going to get down on one knee, Joseph Scrimshaw is, and say, will you accept this L to Mr. Jo to Mr. Andrew DeMolanta? Because there's just there's no way. I just don't see – Joseph Scrimshaw, here's the thing. He's been the only guy who's been competitive with Damon. He's been the only guy who's been competitive with Damon. I know a lot of people are saying DeMolanta, and I just don't see where that's coming from. I don't see why y'all think Andrew DeMolanta is going to blow, blow past Joseph Scrimshaw. To me, Joseph Scrimshaw, in my opinion, is the favorite to win the entire tournament, let alone get out in the first round. I don't see that. We have uh, G Nappyhead <laughs> says, unless Barbarian goes all the way in IG, which is entirely possible, then there's no way the exchange makes it out of both tournaments on top. And, and that's what we're talking about. That's why it is so important for Andrew DeMolanta to perform here uh, in this very first round, in this entire tournament, really. He needs to get much-needed points for the Finstock Exchange. And, 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 Jim, if you were the Finstock Exchange, if you're Bobby Gucci and you know this, what kind of preparation do you think they're putting Andrew DeMolanta through? Because, really, they don't have anybody like an Alex Damon to help quiz them. They don't have anybody like a Joseph Scrimshaw. They have, really, Andrew DeMolanta quizzing himself. Yeah, because let's face it, you have all, all, all you really have in terms of a manager is a guy who drives a white windowless van and wears a half shirt, you know, on a good day. So <laughs> you're going to need someone. You're going to need to bring in some big guns that at least maybe have maybe have the barbarian quiz him, maybe have other members of the faction that have some Star Wars knowledge, have some Star Wars fandom really quiz him on that stuff and really build almost like a fake. The best way I can tell people is I always say learn the way your brain synapses work best. For me, I'm a very big audio learner. I have to hear something. If I hear something repeated, I can I can repeat it verbatim. Uh, I don't learn things by reading them. It's just not how my brain interprets things. So if you can figure out the way his brain makes those connections and can do the best kind of recall, that's the best way to study for this type thing. And I think Black Metal Striker here says the exchange will probably be in the top five after these two tournaments. But if wins, singles, and teams tournaments start, they will be back in the running. Obviously, they have guys who've gone all the way in the tournaments before. Cactus Becky says Scrimshaw and Napsock should definitely at least brush up if they're coming in without studying. I don't think they'll be ready for these competitors with something to prove. I think that that is a really smart point, and especially comes into play when we talk about Andrew DeMolanta and Joseph Scrimshaw. Scrimshaw's been a guy who I talked about with Ken how they, they, ha they know what they know. They're going to come in with their dukes up. But I think Joseph Scrimshaw is one of the only guys in the league next to Alex Damon who can go in without studying and still knock any almost anybody out. But I don't think that either one of these guys are going to go out there and get blown out. I think this is going to be maybe the most competitive match in the very first round, Jim. Absolutely. I totally agree with you, my man. All right. So let's move on, though, because I want to talk more about how the teams are all going to match up here and where we are at with – all the points, but when we move to the other side of the bracket, let's start with the play in game because this is something new. We don't know who Ken Napsok is going to face in the very first round just yet. Because when you look at the bracket, you have Andres Cabrera versus Josh Cavedo. Andres, we know, we know about Andres. We just saw him a couple weeks ago, uh, have not the most lovely performance <laughs> against the debuting Robert Parker. Pretty much got smashed like Goldberg would do to Hugh Morris back in 1997, but. He is a guy who knows a whole hell of a lot about Star Wars. He's a former uh, host of Jedi Council over back in the Collider days, along with Ken Napsok. So we know he's got the goods. And then Josh Cavedo. The thing is, we don't know anything about him. No. He's never competed. He's, he's been, his name's been floated around a lot as someone who's knowledgeable. And Roxy Stryer made a pretty big play to get him. She thought, okay, if Alex Damon isn't in this thing, I need a st I need another Star Wars player who can go out there and get me points. And when she lost out on Molly, I feel like this is this was just the way to go. Uh, I will say this: Roxy Stryer is not going to go after people that she thinks aren't going to put points on the board for her. She just isn't. She's she's incredibly hungry to prove that she is the best manager in the league. And I think it's more dangerous playing someone that you don't really know that much about because you just don't know what their strengths and weaknesses are. And that comes into play, especially during the wheel round. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think that you hit the nail on the head when you talk about Roxy Stryer. She's not going to make a move without doing her research, putting putting the uh, and, uh, Josh Cavedo through the ringer. Because the thing is, I talked to a lot of these managers, and a lot of these managers did not pick anybody up unless they quizzed them or they had game tape on them. And I think that Roxy Stryer probably sent a whole bunch of Star Wars matches over to Josh Cavedo and said, okay, how you playing? Let me know. You know, how you doing? And that's why she made the move for him. And the thing is, 
Josh Cavado was originally drafted by Robert Meyer Burnett, who seemingly every trade had to go through it during this season. And Robert Meyer Burnett ends up getting Ken Knapsack. This is what we talked about. Sam ships Kim Knaps Ken Knapsack over to the burning droogs. Robert Meyer Burnett gets him and says, okay, I got, I got my star Wars guy. I got a former champion. I got somebody who wrote a book about star Wars. I'm good. So let me give up Josh Cavado to the trading block. Roxy Stryer trades J T E one of the greatest team players of all time. A member of the Patriots had a great run in singles a couple of years back Moved out of L.A., so maybe not the most active competitor, but she trades JTE, which is a marquee name. I mean, hell, there's an entire rule named after the man, the JTE rule. She trades JTE over to Robert Meyer Burnett, picks up Josh Cavado, plus a third-round pick. I thought it was a really smart move for her, but she's got a lot riding on this, too. Rock stars haven't been off to the greatest start. They, you know, they had that big loss of the odd couple versus who's the boss. We've seen some... You know, not great ways to starting out for for Roxy Stryer in the so far in this season. She needs to have a really talented player in both tournaments to try to work her way up to be in the conversation as the number one pick or the number one seed here in the movie trivia showdown. So she's got a lot riding on this play in match. I gotta say though, the fact that RMB is always always involved in trade makes me feel like he's like a day trader of players do you know what i mean like he's just he's just looking to get through whatever the next thing is and it makes me a little nervous that he doesn't have a long-term plan when it comes to the schmodown i don't know if he has a long-term plan even for his life but <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean like at the that the rate that he is that he's taking these trades it just makes me go Okay, but what's your long-term goal? Are you just trying to make those quick plays to get players and hope that they get you points while you have them and then you can quickly get other things for them? He's like the kid that's always trading up his lunch on the playground. You know what I mean? It's like he starts with like some bologna sandwich and somehow ends up with like a really good Lunchable with like a candy in it, you know? <laughs> yeah, uh, all trades had to go through Mar Mar Burnett. And I want to pick up on something right here. Quick question. Does the play-in match count for the same points as the other tournament matches? No, it doesn't. So here's the thing. In the play-in match, it's worth two points. A win is worth two points. A knockout worth three. So it's not worth it, the potential four points in the rest of the tournament. But still, you can pick up some really good wins, uh, or some good points with a win in this play-in match. And that's, again, why I think that Roxy Stryer needs to get this win. Dominic, the writer, says R&B equals the athletics manager when it comes to trades, LMAO. He uh, gets you know, it. Bill, he yeah. gets it. Dominic gets it. It's a money It's a money ball type strategy. It's you get stuff for cheap that you know you can turn over and you can flip and you can make some money off of while still getting points. Well, here's the thing. So the winner of this match, whether it be Andres Cabrera or if it's going to be Josh Cavado, the unknown Josh Cavado, who could be a monster. This guy could be a monster. We have no idea. But um, when we talk about it, they have to play Ken Napsok. Ken Napsok is a very interesting competitor when it comes to this tournament because he could either be lights out, like we know Ken can be because he's a former champion, or he can be, like you said, a little less motivated. Maybe the rest of the league has passed him by. He did a promo where he said, I'm not going to be out here studying like the rest of these people. You know, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to do what I can. And um, there was rumors even about Ken Napsok retiring from, competitive, from competition before joining this uh, tournament here. So whether it's Andres Cabrera, whether it's Josh Cavado, how do you think that their chances are against Ken Napsok, maybe a slightly less than motivated Ken Napsok? I think a slightly less than motivated Kim Napsok is still better than the majority of most players. And so for... I think for anyone coming in that's an unproven entity, just seeing the name Ken Knapsack across from you in that in that bracket is enough to make you go, oh, oh boy. You know, it's just that allure that he does have. Yeah, and 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 C Farrell 48 says, uh, well, see, he said Ken said the other night on his stream that he was watching Jedi to study up, wouldn't count him out. So if Ken studies, that's my thing about Ken. I love the guy. And I thought that. Trading him away, uh, Sam Levine trading to Robert Meyer Burnett, I thought that, that was a good pickup for Robert Meyer Burnett when a lot of people thought, oh, I don't know. But if he studies and he takes this thing seriously and he comes in to compete, I would not be shocked if we see Ken Napsok in the finals because when you look at his side of the bracket, it would kind of lead to that being a possibility. Say he beats Josh Cavado or Andres Cabrera, then he plays winner of Laura Kelly, Sean Sullivan, which we'll get to in a minute. 
And although Laura Kelly's a beast, she hasn't been watching Star Wars as long as Ken Knapsack, Ken Knapsack has. I don't know why I can't say his name today. Ken Knapsack has. I know she you're has... rubbing off on me, dude. Come on. <laughs> I can't say it. He's either Kim or he's Map Mapsock. I can't say it. But, but I will say yeah. this. Someone nailed it in the chat. They basically said he's Luke from The Last Jedi. And I was like, that makes a lot of sense, actually. That said, we don't have anything in the budget to project a hologram. So, I mean, we're running on, we're running at home here, guys. Well, that that is interesting because I wonder for all of these competitors, and let me ask you this now, Jen, because you brought it up. When we talked about Molly Damon earlier, we talked about the pressure of performing in her first match, lights on, thousand people, Chicago, Illinois, sold out, screaming fans. That's a lot of pressure for your first match. But now this match, you're at home. You're comfortable. You may be in some PJs. You know what I mean? You, you just had a morning coffee. You're relaxed. You're more in your environment. How big of how big of an impact do you think that's going to have on all of these matches? I'm not going to lie, Brad. I'm sitting here in sweatpants right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's something to be said about playing hey, in an hey, environment. Where I'm just saying there's something to be said about playing in an environment that you're comfortable in. It just takes the uh, it takes a lot of the pressure away. You know, it takes a lot of the the things that make competing in the schmodown scary. Like it takes that away. It removes those as factors. And so who knows? Maybe, th maybe that will give the rookies an upper hand at this point. I think that it could. I mean, again, if you're relaxed, you're in your element, you're not worried too much about, um, you know, being camera ready. You're not worried about the audience in the crowd because I, I know even just going up there and calling matches, you know, at the, at the studios, whenever they're tape days. And you might know this too. There's a sense of a pressure to perform and to entertain. And I think that the people who might not be natural entertainers, people who are more, you know, off camera than on camera, this really does help them because you're not trying to be funny. You're not trying to be quirky. You're just trying to go in there and answer questions. And I think that some people who might not be used to performing like a Josh Cavado, Molly Damon, who we've only seen once, um, everyone else has been in the mix before. But I think for those players, this may put them at ease. And I really think that they could go out there and perform at a high, high level without all the auxiliary distractions. A hundred percent. Could not agree with you more, Brad. Um, again, Cavill is an unknown. We don't know if he's going to come in here and be like the next Robert Parker. Um, but we don't know if he's going to come in here and just be like a regular guy who doesn't know much about Star Wars. He might, he might have the, 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 the fandom that Cody Rhodes has, but maybe not the knowledge that a Joseph Scrimshaw has. And, and Gene unknown. Appyhead does have a good point here where he says some people perform best under pressure. I'm one of those people when it comes to being a performer, but I don't know if that's how I am in terms of playing the game. Yeah, and, and here's the even, the even the thing here, though, when you think about the Josh Cavado and uh, Andres Cabrera match is there's also some bad blood between these factions, right, between Swag and the Rockstars. I talked about Winston getting down on one knee and handing Roxy the L and literally handing her the L when when he went out there and got the win with Adam Lavick uh, and 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 uh, Shannon Miller going out there and beating Jared Hybon and Jim Vavida. What do you think that the the motivations here are behind the teams? Because you know the managers are in their ears. The managers want to make sure that they go out there and get a win for their team. And then the the rivalries here, swag, rock stars, and again you have Andres Cabrera coming off of that really. Let's be honest. It was an embarrassing loss to Robert Parker. I know that Andres had been out for a little while. Yeah, but, but I think with Robert Parker, you're looking at something special. You're looking at a kid that's potentially a phenom, and I don't think that you can judge Cabrera based on this one performance. Uh, here's the thing. And you know what? <laughs> As a Houston sports fan, who typically, whoever beats Houston in the playoffs goes on to win the championship, whether it be the Chiefs or the Warriors, I know what it's like. And a lot of times I try to tell myself, well, hey, at least we lost to the champions. But guess what? It doesn't make it any better. That's just me trying to make it better in my head. And even though Andres Cabrera may have lost to a potential phenom in Robert Parker, that loss still hurts. It's still oh, embarrassing. Yeah. And you know he wants to avenge that loss. And I don't know, even if he's in the right state of mind, to compete this soon after such a huge and embarrassing loss on his record if he's able to be in the right frame of mind to compete against Josh Cavado. Absolutely. Absolutely. Want to go back to the bracket? Let's go back to the bracket. Let's look at the other side here for a second. 
Um, I mean, Ooh. the other match that we have. Oh, oh, here we go. Lights out, Laura Kelly. That's what yes. she's be known by now after being managed by the queen of corruption herself. She was the luminous Laura Kelly, but now she it's lights out. The dark she's side's more more appealing. Let's just put it. It's more fun. Let's be real. Uh, Ken but and convinced her that the light side wasn't for her. Again, we're, we're seeing a new Laura Kelly here. Laura, who is one and two in the division, but was so impressive when we last saw her uh, at the spectacular. I mean, beyond impressive. Uh, what do you think her motivations are going into this? Again, out of the 62 questions that were asked to this incredible competitor, she got 55 of them right. That's good for 88 0.7% accuracy rating. That's well above the league average, which is 82. This is somebody who knows their Star Wars and can be deadly in this tournament. And let's be real, though, Brad. The fact that she's got Shannon Barney in her corner now, and with Shannon Barney comes Mike Kalinowski, comes Chance Ellison, comes guys that have held belts before, and they know how to study. I've watched it. They are absolute machines when it comes to preparing for matches, and trust me, they will have her ready for this first round. I don't see this going well for Sullivan at all. I don't see it. I agree. I mean, even though Sean Sullivan competed earlier this season in Star Wars, looked great. I mean, he looked like he could be somebody who could go out there and put a beating on you. It's not going to be an easy match for her. He's um, a little under league average. He is uh, at 80%, but that's only after one match. That could go up. It could go down. But the sample size that we've seen from the guy, he's a credible threat. He is a credible threat. And for his team, the Den, think about that. He, like Andrew Demolanta, is the gatekeeper for the Finstock Exchange. If he takes that L where it guaranteed someone's going to come out in first place that is not named the Finstock Exchange, and it could be the Den. The Brad, den stop the smiling. Stop smiling when you say it, okay? <laughs> it could be the Den. <laughs> Makes me so excited. Oh, but I, but you're a 100% right. This is a chance for someone like corruption that has a strong competitor in star Wars, like Laura Kelly to make the moves they need to, to bring themselves back up in the standings. And trust me, I've spoken to Shannon Barney a lot, a lot over the past week, and they are more than ready for this tournament and the interdictum tournament because they will have Mike Kalinowski and chance competing in that. And I don't think the world is ready for this new brand of corruption. They're about to see. Well, I mean, if corruption can go out there and Laura Kelly is someone who could make it all the way through this tournament, I think a lot of people might earmark her and Scrimshaw as a potential final. But if she goes out here and performs really, really well for corruption and then Mike Kalinowski, you got to imagine he's going to be in the finals of the IG tournament against Robert Parker. That that would be the Vegas odds. If, it, if I were putting the odds together, it'd be Mike Kalinowski versus Robert Parker. You're right. Corruption is setting themselves up for a season changing few weeks here in these two tournaments. But to go back to the den, Sean Sullivan could be the MVP of the den. If he pulls out wins against Laura Kelly and then he beats whoever comes out of Josh Cavado and Ken Knapsack, finds his way in the finals. I mean, and, and he didn't even have to win it. Just those two, those two alone could put the den in first place. They're only four points out of first place. They could come out of this tournament as the number one team. Oh. I'm just, I'm just so excited that it your cheeks not. are just, they got to be hurting by now, right? They're a little rosy. They're a little rosy from smiling. <laughs> but I think that again, this is a massive opportunity. And, 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 and I don't know if people, when these tournaments were announced, if they realize that this is more than just having tournaments for tournament's sake, this could determine the rest of the season. This could determine the winners of the season, which team is going to walk out as the number one team in the movie trivia showdown and Sean Sullivan, Andrew DeMolanta, they're in very interesting places. hundred percent. But like I said, I just don't feel good for Sullivan going into this match at all. He had a great showing against wit, but Laura Kelly is just something else. There's something else about her, some intangible where she just is absolutely unrattled in these types of situations. Look at you getting called out. <laughs> Does, uh, is, it right? is that the switchblade? Is that the switchblade right now? Is that the switchblade? Uh, you know what? Again, I, I don't have anything against the Finstock Exchange. I actually like all those guys a whole hell of a lot. But just if they lose, that's fun too. Here's the thing. I've always, again, I'm a Houston sports fan. I've always rooted for the underdog. I'm always the underdog. And to me, when I look at the Finstock Exchange, I'm just getting flashbacks. I'm getting flashbacks of 2016, 2017, 2018, I'm, I'm feeling like the Houston Rockets versus the Warriors. They are the Warriors. They are KD, Steph, Clay, Draymond, Iggy. They, that's who they are. They are 
the greatest team ever assembled so far in the movie Trivia Schmodown. It's not even a competition at this point. So if somebody comes up from behind them and they get the dub, that'd be awesome. The exchange appreciates the way Kate shot herself in the foot by trading her best IG player before the tournament. Of course, uh, they have you seen Brandon Hanna going off lately, by the way, Jen? Oh, my God. Ugh. Who cuts a seven-minute pro bowl that's not The Rock? <laughs> You're saying you know he went on I mean? a little too long? A little too long, but he does. He made some. He made some fair points, but he's taking shots at pretty much everyone. He's lucky he didn't come for me because I'll shake somebody. <laughs> I've heard. I've heard that you do. <laughs> the rumors are out there. The rumors are out there. But again, hey, look, I'm like that. I'm like that big sister where it's like I will protect everybody in the league until they. But when they step out of line themselves, I'll be the person that's there to call them on it. Hey, Ben, do me a favor real quick. Uh, pull up the Ken Napsuck sam Whitwer match, if you can, the, the closing seconds to it, because I want to I want to show that to everybody to kind of prove a point to go back to Ken Napsuck versus either Josh uh, Josh Cavedo or Andres Cabrera. Because the thing is, that match, when we talk about Star Wars, is always going to be brought up. That's the first thing people think about. They think about Sam Whitwer versus Ken Napsuck. Spectacular match of the year came down to the closing seconds. And again, to go back to the Houston Rockets, which everything does for me. When Chris Paul, when Chris Paul suffered that hamstring injury, when we were up in that series, we only needed one more game. When he suffered that hamstring injury, it haunted us. And go ahead and click play on this, Ben. It haunted us. And with Ken Napsock right here, before, yeah, I, Ken definitely wasn't robbed. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an Iron Man match. When you look at these final seconds here and you see how close that it was, and it came down to the final question between these two guys, between Ken and Sam Whitwer. Ken was defending the championship. No one had ever successfully defended it. This is the first time we'd seen the Iron Man match format ever in the movie Trivia Schmodown. It was so highly intense. And look at the look how close the score was right here, Jen. 43-40. And it gets closer as the second. We should goes drop, down. yeah. We should drop out for a second and watch this last minute if you're cool with that. Yeah, yeah, let's hear it. Can you put the audio on this, Ben? I'm not sure if he can. I think he's gonna I think he's gonna pull it up and come back with it. Yeah. But that last minute, I remember watching it live and it was so heart wrenching. I think we have it right here. Suffering. Correct. What is the name? What is what is the emperor referring to when he asked Luke, you want this, don't you? Ken. His lightsaber. Okay. Correct. What what did R two D? You know Riley bought these suspenders hey. just for this too. Wow. Happy birthday, Mark Riley, by the way. Correct. What did C three PO call R two as they entered the escape pod in Episode four? Sam, overweight mob of grease. Correct. Three point game. How many Imperial Scout troopers pursued the Ewok who stole the speeder bike? Ken. Three. Correct. Two point game. Who directed Rogue One? Ken. Gareth Edwards. Correct. One point game. Who wrote oh my the God. for the Phantom Menace? Sam. George Lucas. Correct. What was Han Solo's response to Lando's I'm sorry apology? Sam. Sam. Oh, uh, I'm, well, I'm sorry. Say it again. Uh, you're out. That's, that's, that's one point left. Okay. In episode seven, who sets off the oh. oscillator Six. in Starkiller Base? Ken. Chewbacca. How many times his normal rate? Oh, my God. He would spare his life. Sam. Pick a triple. Oh. Oh. What just happened? Oh. What just when that buzzer went off at the end, like Ken lost the majority of his hair. Like it was, <laughs> it was a huge loss. Oh my god! Look at the from Christian and Mark there. This I remember watching live, and I was, I mean, on the edge of my seat. It really reminded me of Sean and Brett, WrestleMania 12, that first Iron Man match where you did not know what was going to happen. It came into overtime. This was a last second win by Sam Whitworth. And when you look at that, you wonder the motivation then from Ken. We talked about is he less motivated? Does he have the fire in the belly? Is he the same competitor that he used to be? But after suffering a win like, I mean, a loss like that, when you were so close, to beating the man that everyone said was unbeatable. You can't touch at Sam Whitmer. You can't do it. He is unstoppable. Ken Napsok was literally seconds away from beating the man. One question, one point, the clock hit zero, 
that has to be a motivating factor for Ken Napson. But also, Brad, this is a completely different kind of format than what these guys are going to be facing in the actual tournament. You know what I mean? Like this is an essentially an Ironman format. And that, I think, if you were to make this whole tournament that, then we'd be talking totally different ball game here. But we also have to talk about people being able to handle the logistics of the game and the strategy of the game. And I feel like that's going to give certain players a leg up because while certain people may have more actual Star Wars knowledge, they don't necessarily have all of the game skills yet mastered. Does that make sense? No, that makes perfect sense. And I think that's something that we always talk about. Just because you're the most knowledgeable player doesn't mean you're the best Schmodown competitor. But I'm saying it more, not not so much the excuse me, the format for Ken for the Iron Man match. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the motivation of that last second loss. Yeah. And to be able to come back, go all the way, run the gambit in the tournament. I think that that would motivate me. If, if Ken Napsok was You Michael think he's Jordan, just sitting at home in the dark watching the end of that match over and over and over again with his hood on, just like ready for this? I mean, that's the vision I like to have of Kim Napsok. I think it was. I mean, he is, like you said, like he he's meditating like Luke Skywalker in The Last Jedi, just waiting to give a force projection into this tournament and go all the way um, and, and meet his nemesis again or, or just try to get that championship back. And I think that this has to be a motivation. But when you talk about Ken and you talk about the strategy of the game, do you? let me ask you a question. In the movie Trivia Schmodown, do you think ring rust is a thing? Yes, 100%. I think that there's been players that have come back from long hiatuses and they just they just weren't ready. And I think it also happens sometimes to title holders just because they'll be waiting for such a long time before they'll get the next match because they're just waiting for whatever tournament is playing or whatever number one contender matches there are. And so they've got to just wait out there for that match to happen. And then it's like, well, yeah, but they've been sitting there waiting. So like what's supposed to keep them fresh? Do you know what I mean? Especially when like you're talking about a championship match where there's the speed round. Speed round is something that you could take the buzzers home as much as you want. You either have fast reflexes or you don't. I was playing some game the other day, uh, the murder trivia game on Twitch with Emma and a bunch of people from the Schmodown. And there were certain things that I was just an epic fail at because I'm not like a fast reader. So like, that's not how my brain computes things. Like I've talked about on here. I'm very fast when I hear things, but if I've got to read the question, I'm screwed. Cause my brain has to be like, da, 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 da. so like figure it out. And then it computes it later, you know? So, oh yeah, thank you. If you were there, you saw my epic win. Animal questions for the win. F's in the chat for everybody else. Uh, it was fantastic though. What are you talking about? Murder trivia? Oh, you weren't here for that murder trivia? Oh, you. Ha oh, Brad, I got to get you hooked up for that. I got to get How you hooked that up work? for that. How does that work? What murder trivia? The murder trivia game. Basically, you just get on yeah. with uh with Jackbox trivia with Emma, and she hosts and she walks you through it. And I don't. I'm not really a gamer. I don't consider myself someone who's good at this type of stuff. But I happened to get a bunch of questions that were about animals and about Taylor Swift, things that I didn't even realize I had that much deep knowledge about. But like I like churned out all these. Oh, thank you. See there, there you go. Uh, I see what you did there. But. I happened to get lucky. I basically ended up stealing someone's life force, which is what I do in life. And then I won. Well, hey, well, congratulations to you. I, I, I still don't understand anything that you just said, but you're the winner and I appreciate your enthusiasm. Um, again, thanks. Make sure y'all have any um, questions for Jen or I or anything about the movie trivia showdown or the Star Wars uh, tournament. Make sure you get it in, in the stream labs there, or, or and we will make sure that we read that out. But again, and I know that Ken has had matches since then, but I still think that that would be a motivating factor for me. But when we talk about ring rust, I think that the best example of ring rust is a guy like Dan Merle, the greatest of all time, retired, yeah. oh. comes back and gets Andrew Guy. Something that was supposed to be a layup. And let's be like, let's be clear. I'm going to call a spade a spade. That's what that match that match was set up to be a softball match for Dan. And it did not work out that way. No, but, but that's my point about the ring rust is when you look at some of these people, a lot of them have been more active. I mean, we haven't seen Molly Damon in a while, uh, but Laura Kelly competed recently. Adam Witt recently, Sean Sullivan recently, Andres Cabrera, even though not in star Wars competed recently, they have some reps in. They're a little bit warmer than someone like a kid Napsuck or maybe even a Molly Damon, Joseph Scrimshaw, people who we haven't seen in, in the you know in somewhat of a long time. And I just wonder if that's going to come into play or 
if you're great, you're great. And it just doesn't wear off. I mean, Mike worried, dropped 40 at 40. You're worried about ring rust. I'm more worried about people looking past certain opponents to the next opponent that they think they're going to face. Do you know what I'm talking about? Where like some people will be like, oh, for example, if you want to equate this to sports, oh, we're playing Cleveland this week. <laughs> It's practically a buy, no worries. Right. And the next thing you know, you're getting blown out by Cleveland. Like what? That's what I worry about when it comes to tournaments like this. And that's why it all comes down to mentality. And that and, and that go, brings me back to all these first round matches. Is there's certain pressures on everybody? There's a pressure on Ken Knapsack to perform, given his pedigree as a former champion. There's a lot of pressure on Andrew Demolanta knowing that he holds the keys. He is the gatekeeper for the Finstock Exchange to remain in first place. Sean Sullivan, pressure on him to go out there and get a victory and put the den in first place. And then Laura Kelly, someone who, what a great match that she had at the Spectacular. Actually, if, um, if Ben, you could pull up that match, I'd like to look at some of that with Laura Kelly because she's somebody who knows what it's like to go against Alex Damon. And that means a lot too. It means a lot to know what you have at the end of the rainbow but for lack of a better term, and to know what you're going up against. And she knows what she's got to go up against in Alex Damon. And I think that that helps her prep for this tournament and being able to be in a five-round match. That's the thing that not a lot of people can say that they've been in, especially people like Molly Damon, Adam Witt, Sean Sullivan, Andres Cabrera, Josh Cavedo. These people haven't been in five-round matches, and that's a whole nother element to this that you have to be prepared for at the end of this thing. Because it's one thing just to get through the tournament and the thing is, it to me, it's like if you, back in the '90s, you're working your way up in the ranks as a as a heavyweight contender, and you know, if I get the number one contender shot, I got to go against Mike Tyson. That's kind of <laughs> <laughs> for me, and and that's kind of what the win the winner has to go against the most dominant champion in any division that we've ever seen, and that is Alex Damon to have that prior experience. Let's go ahead and play this, um, Ben. If you can get maybe toward the the end of the into the match that'd be great jeremy hastings yeah. who had the call sign of rogue four look how close it was at this point 21 to 20 against alex damon that's like being up on the cards you know to me. four rounds to five going into the 10th against mike tyson three two one ten, there's ten. a third round of five Alex, how many points did you wager? Three. You wagered three points. And your answer? Derek Hobby Clivian. Three points. Three points for, for Alex. Alex. Damn, that is correct. And Laura, how many points did you wager? I, I did two. I don't have it. Uh, she had two, two so and she didn't two. have it. Boy, that's a that's All a right. costly miss here, Ken, because you give Alex Damon a little bit of headway, and he's usually going to take advantage. Now, yeah. we move into round number four. For round number four, the, a series of numbers. We need three numbers from each of but you. Again. It, from one. The betting round is where she started to fall off actually a little bit as the match went on. But but now she has that experience. Yeah. She knows yeah. what to expect. She knows how to strategize a little bit better in the game. As far as worth five points. There's no penalty for missing a question. There is no stealing in round number five. Alex, like I said, you do have the lead currently. So we're going to get your numbers first from one to 20. What feels yeah. good, sir? I'll take two. This is when he definitely pulled away. But but talk to talk to me about that, Jen. Having that experience against the champion, knowing what you're going to go up there and compete against, do you think that that benefits you in this tournament? Oh, absolutely. You know, I feel like I always equate things back to sports. Sorry, but I feel like <laughs> if you, <laughs> you know, like it's it's like with a uh, with Pat Mahomes. You know, when he had that devastating loss uh, two years ago, like it prepared him for the next time. When he was able to take the team to the Super Bowl, like you, sometimes you need to face your enemy again, and you're like, you're not going to make the same mistakes twice. Sorry, guys, this is the benefits of doing things at your home studio. You just randomly kick your light over. <laughs> Did I lose everybody? No, oh, fantastic! I don't know what happened. It just, it just, it just popped out. So you're saying about Patrick Mahomes? Yes. No, I was just saying. You know, I, I feel like sometimes your your biggest losses end up being the chance for you to see your opponent and know what you're up against the next time. And so it's like, while you may not win the match, you will always take something away from the match with you in terms of knowledge and not only on your opponent, but the game. Yeah. And I think that, I think that it's not right. And now Miss Movie says, how do managers work in this online format? Do they sit in purgatory and raise their hand if they want to challenge something? It's a that great question. Is a question. 
I'm not I'm not 100 sure on that. Ben, do you know exactly how managers operate in in the online tournament? I think it will be something like that. Will the where like if we're doing on streamyards, they'll be sitting backstage. And especially when it comes to Star Wars and Inner Geekdom, it's probably going to be up to the player to be like, hey, that question question was weirded wrong or something like that, or I want to challenge this. And then they'll talk to their manager. Then like, you know, who's ever running the stream, Christian or Mark. Or, yeah, someone or me, mentioned or, having phones on the side. I have a feeling all technology is banned from something like this. Like it's all- Yeah, having a phone on the side, it, it, I, I don't like that. Uh, no, yeah. not at all. Exactly. Yeah, so, so uh, be in the private chat with the challenge. There you go. Boss chiming in. He's always okay. watching. <laughs> Wait, hey, Ben. Ben, come back for a second. Ben, come back for a second. What's up? Now you're gonna be you're gonna be in the IT tournament, of course. But yeah. these but the Star Wars, when you look at this, it's an eight person tournament. It, we're gonna get to the nitty gritty almost instantly. Um, but what do you think about Laura Kelly, what we were just discussing, having that experience against Alex Damon? How how important do you think that is in this tournament? Oh, it's huge, especially like having the live experience against Alex Damon is huge. And I mean, that's what separates, uh, you know, the, the champions is the speed round and the betting round. You saw it in Atlanta. You've seen it so many times, countless times. Five round matches are a different beast, but these aren't five round matches. If this was a three round match, it was a one point game until we went to the betting and speed round. So she knows her stuff. And Sean, Sean's my, my teammate. I have full faith in him, but that's she's kind of the number one seed outside of the legacy picks of Scrimshaw and Ken. Like they they have cemented their place on the star Wars Rushmore of the Schmodown. So they, they can never be questioned, but active players that you see doing this day in and day out playing trivia, not just knowing star Wars, which, you know, no one's argues that Ken and Joe know star Wars. Probably it's like Lucas Filoni, Ken and Joseph Scrimshaw and Alex Damon are right underneath him. Um, but playing trivia is a different thing. We we learned that, uh, and so I I like Laura a lot in this tournament. If she gets by, uh, she gets by Sean. There's and that's the thing. There's no slouches. You have Adam versus Molly. You got Joseph versus Andrew. Andrew's probably the yeah. Hungry. Throw up the actual. Throw up the bracket graphic again I if you wouldn't mind. It. Let me see if I can find it again. I don't know why it closed for some reason, but yeah, let me find it again. Thanks, man. Uh, yeah, but yeah. Help, just helpful for my my sports brain. Absolutely, to see absolutely. I don't know why it went away. I had it up. Uh, here we go. Here we go. And right there. Uh, Thank yeah. you, dear. You're welcome. So yeah, like having Molly and Adam. Like Adam pulled out that huge five pointer against Sean. Right. So you know he knows it. And then Andrew, like I said, all he talks about is this. I've been on his podcast, his Star Wars one, and in his Schmodown one. He literally started his own Schmodown podcast with his wife because he loves this game so much. And then, but then Joseph is Joseph Scrimshaw and same with this one. Like uh, this, I don't, you know, we saw Ace and inner geekdom that could, that's a whole different thing. Cause I mean, Alex did good in Atlanta. He, he wasn't Alex Damon star Wars in Atlanta in no. his inner geekdom match. So it's two totally different things. And then Sean's one to know Laura's uh, one or one. And looking at this and, look, Laura, and looking Kelly, at this Laura bracket Kelly is one and, two. and one looking and two, at yeah. this bracket, to be honest though, I think that, Laura Kelly has easily, I think she has the easiest path to a championship match in terms of her side of the bracket. The only person I feel like is really going to give her a fight is going to be going up against Ken Knapsack. That's where I feel like that's going to end up. Um, looking at the other side, I feel like the other side of this bracket is just loaded with absolute killers. And that kind of makes me a little more scared for Molly to be able to get past someone like a scrimshaw. So who do, who do you guys um, have? I, uh, who do you guys like? Give give everyone your guys bracket breakdown of like. So let's talk about let's talk about Molly versus Adam. Who do you guys have winning Molly versus Adam? I think we both got Molly, don't you? Molly yeah. in that one, okay. And then Joseph Andrew. Scrimshaw. I got Joseph. Man. I got Joseph. And here's the thing I want to say about Andrew Demolanta again. He's zero two. He has made his entire purpose to go out here and beat. Alex Damon. He wants Alex Damon. He's been calling out Alex Damon. He's 0-2. Remind, remind you, he's 0-2. Um, and, and gentleman scientist says Demolanta has the hardest route. He, I mean, he does have a pretty difficult route. I think everyone does. It's an eight-person tournament, so there's no real easy outs in this. But if somebody who's 0-2 and made it their entire mission to go out there and beat Alex Damon, if he loses in the first round, where do you go from there? I think that Demolanta's a wrap. Put a fork in him. He's done. There's nothing else that this man can do. 
You haven't won a match. You made your mission to beat Alex Damon, and you can't even get out of the first round of a tournament. I think that you're done. Absolutely. No, I, I totally agree with you. Sorry, there's been some uh there's been some some controversy going on in the chat that I was enthralled by as well. Exactly. Uh but anyways, <laughs> I I I understand what you're saying as far as there not being any easy outs. I just feel like you you can't look at this bra these brackets and not say that certain players would have an easier time getting to the championship round of this tournament. Cool. Yeah. And then going going to the other side, so you got Laura versus Sean. Who do you guys have doing that? Uh, I have winning Laura. That match? Laura, okay. I have Laura winning that, and then I I really I really do feel strongly, you know, about Ken winning. I I feel like Ken could take either of those guys. To be completely honest, it's just a matter of which Ken shows up. For sure. And then what about, you know, we got the play in game this week. Uh, so the start of the tournament, who do you guys have winning, uh, again, Oof. Ace and Josh. See, I just don't have that. I don't have the background on Josh that I do on Ace. And like we said earlier, Ace didn't have the greatest showing last time we saw him, but yeah. I do feel like that could, that could be one of those things that Brad's right. That could be a motivator for him to try sure. to come back in and have a better performance. All right, so you we've know, got Molly. The thing, though, is, okay. Well, hold on, real quick. No, real no, quick. Go, I want to talk about Andres Cabrera and Josh Cavedo again because we we can go through all these predictions. But what if Josh Cavedo is an absolute monster? We know nothing about him. What if he's an absolute killer? What if he's Damon level and no one is prepared for it? I think the element of surprise works so much in this man's favor. If he's good, if he's great, if he's incredible, we could see a new superstar, and we don't even know it yet. Oh, wait, 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 wait. One second. Ben, I need you to pull up Brett Walker 4's comment. He says, I will bet you $50, Brad Gilmore, that Tim Alonzo wins. Where is it? I'll take that. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that because here's the thing. Here's the thing. Is it worth the name Brett Walker? Brett Walker 4? Hit me up in the DMs, my brother. Let's get an escrow account going because I'll tell you, <laughs> I'll tell you this. Um... Just make, sure your, just make sure your escrow account isn't like Ken Napsock's Venmo because that'll be gone very quickly. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Here's the thing. Let me tell you something about Andrew DeMolanta and Joseph Scrimshaw. You know what Joseph Scrimshaw has done that Andrew hasn't? He's won. He's won a match. I got to go with the guy who has winning DNA. If you're a winner, you're good in my book. Now, he might be one in three, but at least he's won a match. All right? The man has won a match. Here, here's a real here's a real interesting stat too regarding the um the Star Wars division as a whole. A Alex Damon not only has the most wins in Star Wars it, with five, he not only has the most combined knockouts and TKOs with two, he's the only man, aside from Sam Witwer, who isn't playing anymore, he's the only active Star Wars competitor with more than one win. With more than one win, every other person, uh, Sean Sullivan, Joseph Scrimshaw, Ken Napsock, Laura Kelly, all only one win. Everyone else that has competed has either lost or they've only won one. That's crazy to me. And it shows you, again, the dominance of an Alex Damon um, to have five wins in, in this division where no one else has had more than one. Pretty insane. But again, with Andrew DiMolanta, I just I just don't know where you go if you lose again. So that's why. To me, he's counted out. Ben, if you want to pull the bracket back up, we can continue our predictions here. Um, so if we have Molly in round one, and who did you take in in, in uh, between Scrimshaw and Demolanta, Jim? Scrimshaw. Scrimshaw. Okay. Yeah. So we have Molly and Scrimshaw in round two. How do you think that how do you think that shakes out? Molly and Scrimshaw. Oh, it's that's, hard. What I'm, that's what I'm saying. That side of the bracket is just harder for me. It's just harder for me to figure out if if Molly and Scrimshaw, the two that I think will eventually like i said make it to the semi the semifinals i am incredibly nervous for molly because scrimshaw has that experience and he's had better luck against her already so we'll see um and again when you talk about molly and you talk about joseph scrimshaw joseph scrimshaw um 71 out of 80 questions correct I mean, that's that's a very impressive stat. And then when you go to Molly Damon, even though we've had less game tape, uh, out of 19 questions asked, she got 15 correct. So they're pretty, you know, they're somewhat even. Joseph Scrimshaw is sitting at 88, where actually Molly's sitting at 78% accuracy. So he definitely has the advantage there. And I think that if Scrimshaw gets past Andrew DeMolanta, which I am, 
Who else? Who else wants to take that bet? I'll make some money off of this. I don't know if that's legal. <laughs> for me to do. I don't know if we I'm don't allowed have to anything do that. else to bet on right now. Yeah, I don't know if I'm allowed to do that, but whatever. Um, if if he gets past Andrew Demolanta, I think that he wins against Molly Dana. I really do. I think that Joseph Scrimshaw goes all the way into the finals here. I, I think that that's going to happen. I think it's going to be Joseph Scrimshaw versus Laura Kelly. Um, unless Josh Cavado's a monster, unless he's a monster and he's a murderer in Star Wars, unless he's like a Sith Lord that we don't know about. Um, I see this as a Joseph Scrimshaw, Laura Kelly matchup, hmm. which is huge for the quirky Mercs. Ben, if you can go back to the, um, to the standings, I can't believe how <laughs> Brad's going after Demolanta. Hey, PJ, I like you. So you better know your role here, unless you want to feel the wrath of the boat here. But um, when you, when you pull this up, the quirky Mercs, look how low they are in this, in, in the rankings here. They're second to last, only three points. Uh, one win of the season, three losses with a win. If Joseph Scrimshaw is able to run the table and pick up the win for the quirky Mercs, that is a, and see it, say he gets all knockouts. So that's what, uh, I'm bad at math, 16 points. Is that right? Am I right? Four, eight, tw no, 12 points. That'd be 12. Don't, don't look at me. I'm pretty. I'm not good at the maths. So <laughs> uh, it's 12 points. I'll make an appearance wherever the hell they want me to make an appearance. I'll, I'll say it to the man's face. I believe it. Um, <laughs> you look at that. Uh, they could say it to his face. I don't mind. I'll say it virtually. I was told there'd be no math. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> anyway, well, rookie Mercs, if they're able to pick up 12 points, that puts them in second place behind the exchange if they run the gambit here and they beat Andrew DeMolanta in the first round. And look, this is just the way that we see it planned. Like, we see it possibly turning out. If I was going to pick a dark horse on either side of this bracket, it would be the redemption of Ken Nassak. Yeah. And now no, I'm doing the same thing that you are, Brad. Fellow. I, I, yes. I see, I see that he would be the dark horse in all of this because you just don't know what version of him you're going to get and how hungry he truly is. Plus, like we said, it's been a while since we've seen him in competition. Yes. Sorry about that. My thing's going off. Um, yeah, no, you're don't right. Don't forget and, to FaceTime your mom later, Brad. Yeah. No, that, that was the float, the finest lady of all time. So I got to hit uh. her back. Um, <laughs> But Salad Von Baco uh, says, so it's three points for a win and four for a knockout. Yes. So three points for a regular win. If, you, if you're able to get a knockout, that's four, except the play-in match, which is two and three. Exactly. A lot of math going on. But when it comes to picks, again, I don't know anything. I, I, I'm like Charles Barkley. I'm, I'm aware of everything, but I don't know anything. That's I, terrible. I, I can't, <laughs> it's terrible. Tell me, that's ask, terrible. Ask me about the women in San Antonio. I got some big old women. <laughs> Uh, that, that, that's true. I will not have any San Antonio slander on this on this Twitch channel, Brad Gilmore. You watch yourself, sir. I'm just saying that's what Charles said. He says that yeah. Victoria's got a secret out there. Um, oh my god, that's what he said. It's not mine. But let's see, Cactus Becky says I think rock stars and droogs are the only ones who can take over the lead, providing uh, Finstock Exchange has any points right. No, I believe if you pull the um. Let's if you do some. Ma let's let's do some Dan math here. I need help with the audience. I think the Den and Swag have have the, the opportunity. Yeah, look at Swag, just four points behind the Den, two points behind. A, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, the Den, four points behind. And while swag, they may be the only ones to be able to take the lead, I'm just saying that this could be a way for corruption to make up some major ground. Oh yeah, I mean it shoots them all the way up to the top if they're able to run the gambit here, and then the rock stars if they get twelve they would be in the lead. So you see it right there: rock stars, burning droog, swag, the den, all in play here. So again, Roxy could look like the genius of all geniuses because if Josh Cavado goes through and he's a murderer, like we said, all knockouts, twelve points, boom. The rock stars now are in first place, and then the championship matches between two of her competitors. So she's in a she's in a a, a great spot no matter what. Cactus no Becky what. throwing some shade right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm not banging trash cans. Who said that? Brett Walker banging on trash Aww, cans. Oh, <laughs> someone's sensitive. Hey, Brett, can I show something to you real quick? Look at this. Look at this. This is beautiful right here. This is an Astro. <laughs> did you deliberately take him off? Because if you did, that's genius. Hey, guys, it's just me now. <laughs> Who did that? Who did that? Look at, look at I that think it's a right bad there. connection, Brad. <laughs> it is mine. Oh, I believe on the back of that ring, it's supposed to say something like we earned it or something. I don't remember. What's the saying that you guys had that season? Yeah, earn history. Okay. 
We did. We definitely earned history. You can't say that we didn't. We got. We we are a historic baseball team. No matter you what. earned history on every day except for recycling and trash days. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't get me started. Don't get me started. Uh, I, I think you. I think the, the the little battery and buzzer in your vest right there, Brad. I think it messed up your uh, your internet <laughs> connection. So make sure you know no one tear off Brad's uh, Brad's blazer or anything. <laughs> F's in the chat for the Astros. <laughs> Hold on here. Drop the, drop the thing there. Anywho, any, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't care about what anybody is saying right now. But if there's anybody who's going to be the Houston Astros of this tournament, it is Ken Napsuck. I don't know why that makes sense to me, but Ken Napsuck, you know, because he's got something to prove. That's my point. He's got to come back from a con controversy, a controversial. A uh, match. And he's got something to prove. So uh, if you root against Ken, if you root for Ken Napsack, you're rooting for the Houston Astros. I think that makes sense to everybody. No, it doesn't. <laughs> we want Ken to be the redemption story. You can't re like not a cheater. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. He's got to, We got to redeem ourselves. We have to redeem ourselves. And and, and what better way than than this? People are people are lighting me on fire right now. Hey, um, everyone in the chat, though, who do y'all have in the final? I want to see what most people yes, think. Who are the yes. final two going to be? What do you guys I would like think? to know what the consensus is. We've seen you guys and weighing in. Okay, a lot of Astros talk here, so. Okay, well, anyway. So a lot of people are saying Molly versus Laura, Damon versus Kelly, Scrimshaw versus Kelly, Laura and Molly. See, I'm telling think, you, we're on to something. We are on to something. We really are. How dare you? Kelly and Scrimshaw. Uh, a lot of people think that Laura Kelly is going to get it outside of her bracket. That's what I'm seeing the, the majority of. I Some really do. In. I really feel strongly about her being able to wait, work her way through that side of the bracket. It's like I said, Molly, I feel like is going to have the harder road. That said, it's not impossible. It's just going up against somebody that she already has lost to. And hopefully she can overcome that next time. Hey, Ben, if, if you were, uh, I don't know if you're allowed to say it because you have a, a, a faction mate in your in, in this tournament but who do you see in the finals um well i don't think there's like you know we're talking about like knockout points i don't think there's going to be any tkos or knockouts in this tournament like i think everyone's too close the only one i could see unless you know unless both ace and josh cavado surprise the heck out of us that's literally the only one i can see is the play in game versus ken uh if ken is ken of old uh but uh in the finals god that's so hard it's I rough think at a, on the left side, I think I do. I've got, I've honestly got the bottom half. I've got Demolanta. Whoever wins Demolanta Scrimshaw is going to the finals for me. Um, I'm not discounting Adam Witt or or Molly, but I just think that whoever whoever wins that match, because it's like one of the That's going to be a barn burner. Yes, that match that is, is the, going to be a barn burner. Yeah. And then honestly, on the same side, whoever wins Laura Kelly versus Sean Sullivan, I have them in the finals. <laughs> Miss movies. We know Napsock is going to have a terrible internet connection. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Is, but, but Ben, I think that you hit something that was really smart is even though you have the ability to get four points in these matches, I mean, knockouts in Star Wars aren't normal. They don't happen a whole hell of no. a lot. Only two players in the history of the division have knockouts. That is Alex Damon and that's Joseph Scrimshaw. They're the only two that ever do it. And the competitiveness, this isn't like a 16-person tournament, Jen, and you you know this from covering sports. 16-person tournament, you're going to see the one and the eight seed go at it, right? You're going to mm -hmm. see the two and the seven. You're, you might see a couple sweeps, a couple blowouts, right? But in this, it's eight, it's eight person tournament. It, the competition is so ratcheted up right out of the gate. You're not going to have a tune-up game. You're not going to have a warm-up match. So the availability or the likelihood of KOs or TKOs, they're very slim and none. Yeah, but like I said, if I am going to pick my Cinderella story, I hope that it's Ken Napsok because I really would like to see him yeah. have a return to greatness. Uh, and the Ken of old, like I said, the game's changed a little bit, but I, that's not to say that he can't change with the game. I just think it's going to be one of those things where he's going to have to make a lot of adjustments in the game and how he plays the game. I think that he will be able to potentially pull this out, though. And the and best part is there's no surprises. The only surprise would be if the play in the play in match beats Ken, just because we've never seen either of them play. But no one's going to be surprised if Adam beats Molly or vice versa. I don't know if many people are going to be surprised if Andrew beats Joseph. I don't think people will be surprised. I think it'd be a little bit of an upset just because of Joseph's history. 
And I don't think anyone's going to be surprised if Sean beats Laura or vice versa. So I like it's such a pick 'em tournament, not le- let alone a pick 'em game. Yeah, and 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 the thing is too, when you talk about the Cinderella story and Brett Walker four, I think that Brett Walker might be a bookie because everything with him is bets here. He says the over under at one and a half knockouts for the entire People tournament. People are bored and they need something to bet on. I like the next thing you know, it's going to be prop bets. Like yeah, right. what color lightsabers Ken gonna bring to the? <laughs> like, yeah. How many Darth Vader T-shirts will be worn? Um, yeah, FanDuel. Let's FanDuel it up here. Let's let's get some bets going on the movie. Tree How many out. inches above his belly button will Tom Dagnito's shirt ride? You know what I mean? <laughs> but if 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 Ken, uh, thank you by the way, Majora's Mask fan. I'm a Majora's Mask fan too. Um, but even if I mean if Ken is able to go the full gambit and win the tournament, and Molly Damon doesn't. What does that say about Sam Sam, Le- Sam Levine's moves in this free agency, training away a guy who could have gotten you a potential of 12 points in this tournament for Molly Damon, who didn't get to those points, even though you got Ethan Irwin. Ethan Irwin isn't very useful unless he's in these tournaments and getting you points. He's a big name. He's a phenomenal player, former singles champion. But if Ken goes the distance, Robert Meyer Burnett looks like a genius. That's what I'm look- saying. That's what I'm saying, Brad, is this feels like, this feels like the last 15 seconds in a football game and you've got a chance to make it with a field goal. You've got a chance to win the game, but you got to send your field goal unit out and you don't have a reliable field goal kicker. That's when this tournament can really bite you in the ass. Uh, no, I agree. You have to have that that in your back pocket. And Robert Marbonette, people are saying that he's playing money ball. I don't know if he's playing money ball. I think he's playing for this season. Um, you know, he's Ken Napsucks for this season. I got to get him done this season. Sure, maybe with the draft picks and everything, he's thinking down the line. But as far as a Star Wars tournament goes, he's thinking this season with Ken Napsock. And if Ken, you know, doesn't pull it off, I mean, Robert Marbonette, again, he got two first rounders. He's got Ken Napps. He's got a real good, great prospect in Jader. But um, I think that Ken. A lot, a lot of eyes are on him. And, and hey, uh, Ben, real quick, can you pull up Ken's Star Wars promo he put on his um, channel? If you could pull that up, that'd be great. Because Ken did seem somewhat motivated in this in this chat here, or in this um, in this. Uh, you, I think you're. Oh, you're still there, Jen. Here we go. Can you pull that up for us, Ben? When sweet Sam Levine called me to tell me I was traded. Poor Sam had to break the news to me. It's a good move. It's a good trade. I've seen all your analysis. So thoughtful. So intense. So great. You're all good at what you do. I don't have any negative opinions about my new manager either, Robert Meyer Burnett. And Colin Trevorrow decided to leak the script to him. That's crappy as it was. I gotta respect that. No, good move from him, but you see, you all want my statement about the trade. You all want to get me on your podcast, your little interview shows, all those live things you do to get a piece, a small piece of the Schmodown pie. Well, here's my statement. (laughs) I called the chairman. I told the chairman I wanted to retire. I didn't want to compete anymore. I wanted to be a fan just like you guys. Oh, 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 sure, 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 sure. I announced some matches. I like doing that. Sit next to the fine folks on the desk, including the drunk beer drinker, Mark Ellis. Oh, no, no, no. I still have the schmuck. I don't remember this player in Mortal Kombat. I want to go listen to the Take 79 podcast and the and the Reaction Brothers. I want to join uh, the Action Army. <laughs> and he's Admiral. But no. No, he told me I was in the draft. I was competing in the Star Wars division. 
I like Star Wars. Do you like Star Wars? Everyone likes Star Wars. Unless you try to be hip and have some kind of hot take at a 42 tweet thread. Oh, physical violence isn't a bad thing sometimes. <sighs> Couldn't figure it out. Couldn't figure it out. And that's when it hit me. The chairman didn't listen to me. He never does. <laughs> and now I realize the chairman is using me. That's a great point, Wicked. <laughs> <laughs> I just almost <laughs> killed myself. <laughs> he was a Star Wars champion that everyone thinks can't be defeated. I like him. Good boy. Good, good boy. <laughs> now, I think he do have something that can defeat him, and that's Joseph Scrimshaw. Scrimshaw's great. Couple of wheel spins the other direction, couple of numbers this way, and he's your Star Wars champion. That's true. And that's a good thing. I like him. He's a good guy. He's a nice guy. A real nice guy, and that's rare in these times. But you see, there's a whole bunch of new people in the movie trivia showdown. Star Wars division. Oh, yeah. The reason there's not a Harry Potter division or a Marvel division is because Star Wars actually has facts people want to know. And they use it as cred. Oh, but by the way, knowing Star Wars trivia answers doesn't mean... Clink, clink. You know Star Wars, but that's... A clink, point. clink. There's <laughs> all these new names, names I don't really know, and they're good people. They're good people. I know some of them. There's the Lores and the Drews. I think there's a Sean O'Sullivan bartender guy. I don't know what's going on. But see, they all, they all want a good story. They want to get to Alex. They want to beat Alex. And the chairman realizes if one of those up-and-coming superstars beats me, they'll have a head start. They'll be building their legacy on my grave. <laughs> I can see it. I can see the chairman in his Vincent Kennedy McMahon mind going, yeah, yeah, this is what we need. Beat the old guy, beat the old dog, and then you'll be the new star. <sighs> the truth of the matter is, I gotta be honest with you all here, I don't think I can win. I'm not making a joke, I, I don't think I can win. I don't know the difference right now between Han Solo and Ham salad, I really don't. I just don't study. It's not that I don't care. It's, it's passed me by. At least that's what you're all hoping. At least that's what you all want to believe. Because I'll tell you this, up and comers, newbie, the ones who've gotten so close in previous matches, you may think I'm a broken down, beat up droid on the side of the highway that you can step on and step over. And you know what? That might be true. But when you, <laughs> when you finally get into the arena, whether it be in person or virtual reality, You're going to look across at me and you're going to realize, oh no, what did I do? I'm in a match with Ken. Yeah. <laughs> Am I that good? Can I beat him? Can I get to the next level? And suddenly, this isn't a story about me fading off and riding into the sunset. No, this is a story about you collapsing under the pressure of your own expectations. And when you look into my eyes during the match, my legacy will be haunting your very thoughts. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
And there you go. The legend. What do his neighbors think is going <laughs> on? Like, that's what I'm wondering. Oh, my God. That was actual live footage from Mark Riley uh, on his birthday, sipping a glass of wine. Uh, but yeah, so there you go. I think that Ken's playing a little bit of Jedi mind tricks, for lack of a better term, trying to throw people off his scent. Is he studying? Isn't he studying? Even the chat can't get it together. Some people said, I have inside sources that Ken isn't studying. Someone said, oh, well, he said he's studying on his live stream. I think confusion is Ken Napsock's modus of operandi here to get him through the tournament. I love it. I might change my pick to Ken Napsock now. Oh, my God, did I love that promo. You are such a mark. <laughs> I am. I am. I, for Ken Napsock, I, I am. There's a reason, though. And I hadn't even, I, that's the first time I've watched that promo, but because um, I've just, I had my show this morning. But I will say this there's a reason that I thought Ken is going to be the Cinderella story. And I just, I just feel very strong. There's a disturbance in the force, very strongly that. Ken does not want to lose again. And the fact that we've all gotten nothing better to do right now might be the thing that propels Ken to victory. It would be, like you said, the Cinderella story of all time if Ken Napsok can run the gambit and get into the um, finals of this tournament, win the tournament, and then face the man himself, Alex Damon, recapture the championship. Oh, my God. It, it would be great for the storyline of it all. But we know that a lot of times a great story – in sports never always happens, right? It doesn't always come true. It'd be a no. great story for Ken to do it, but I don't know if he will. I'm not having him. I still think it's going to be Laura Kelly versus uh, Joseph Scrimshaw in the finals. Now, who do I see winning it is the question. I think I think we might see a repeat of Joseph Scrimshaw, Alex Damon. I think that's what we're going to see. You may be very well correct. I just, there's just I'm something. I'm always correct. I'm a boat. You're my dream boat for sure. Someone's got to take that away from you. Oh my God. It was the worst thing ever. Getting this <laughs> I, I just, I just have this feeling that we're going to see a hungrier kid nap. So, I mean, we're definitely going to see a crazier kid nap. So we have that to look forward to. Yeah. He is definitely, he is definitely Luke Skywalker in the last Jedi. Will it be enough to get him off the island and into the championship match. We will see. Uh, Jen, I think, though, that that about does it here for us. I, yeah. I, I love talking Star Wars with you. Shout out to Cody Rhodes for coming on. AEW Double or Nothing going down this weekend, Saturday night. Hey, if there's nothing else going on, you might as well watch AEW. Right? Yeah, it's going to be a fan. Honestly, guys, it's going to be a fantastic pay-per-view. If you guys have a chance, check it out. It's going to be on all major cable and satellite providers, Bleacher Report Live and Fight TV if you're international. But, I mean, him facing off against Lance Archer, I just hope no one dies. That's all I can root for at this point. Plus, there's going to be a, uh, a, ladder, a casino ladder match. And we just found out today that there's going to be a mystery entrant. I don't even know who it is. I ask so you. I I have no clue. I have no clue. So I don't even want to venture to guess. Uh, I just know that I did give somebody somebody's phone number the other day, and who knows? Yeah. Well, we'll see what happens with that. We'll see what happens in this tournament. I'm really excited to break it down, and it starts right here on the Schmodown Twitch channel this Wednesday. We're going to see the very first match this Wednesday on the Schmodown Twitch channel exclusively. That's where you'll find this tournament. It won't be on YouTube. you got to come to Twitch. So subscribe, like, follow, whatever you got to do on Twitch uh, to make sure that you see those matches. Do not miss out. And, and, Jen, I think until next time, I think it's time to sign off. Is it not? We should do, we should do this again. We should do this again soon, right? Yeah. Soon? Let's do it yeah. soon. Let's make okay. it happen. All right, Brett Walker, hit me up on Twitter so I can take your money. <laughs> um, until then, that is the great Jen slash Jessica Decker. I am the boat, Brad Gilmore. This is the Movie Trivia Shmoda. We'll be back soon.